and rescheduled for February 1st. This um, is probably one of the most unusual meetings the zoning board's ever had for a variety of reasons. Um, <coughs> our last meeting was in September, and since that time, uh, the term of former chairman and the former secretary of the board both expired, and so the board currently has no elected chairman or secretary. We also have uh, two brand new members tonight, and we have one member who was here for one meeting. So I've been asked to fill in as on a temporary basis to chair the meeting through the election of a new chair. And um, since I agreed to do this, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity uh, and open up nominations for a new chair. And I will be the first to nominate someone. I'll nominate Ann Eldekin to be chair of the zoning board for the year 2000. Second. Second. Are there any other nominations for chair? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of Ann Alderkin being chair for the year 2000, please raise your hands. Abstention. <laughs> what the record showed, but were, I think, six affirmative votes and one, ab one abstention. Um, I will open up the floor for nomination for Secretary of the zoning, zoning Board for the year 2000. Any nominations for our Secretary? I nominate uh, Jack Wheeling. Are there any seconds for that? Okay. Any additional nominations for Secretary? No. <laughs> All those in favor of that, uh, electing Jack Keneally as Secretary, please raise your hands. Six affirmative and one abstention. Okay, with that, um, Ann Elderkin, you can move to this chair, take over as chairperson for the remainder of the meeting. Catherine, I'll ask that you move to Ann's chair, and I'll move to this chair. Well, thank you all for your vote of confidence. <laughs> and I'd like to welcome the, the new secretary to the, to the official position, too. Um, I know you'll have many opportunities to serve <laughs> and to, to make contributions. Um, also, on behalf of, as, as new chair of the board, I'd like to, again, welcome the new members. It's nice to have all, all seats filled. And one of the one of the things that we'll be doing in the, in the upcoming month or, or so is planning an orientation so that you're up to speed on, on all, the, all the ordinances and, and mechanisms of this board. We look forward to that. You did officially call the meeting to order. I did. Right. So we've had the election of officers, and we'll move on to the approval of the minutes of the August 24th and September 28th, 1999 minutes. We'd... Um, you all have had a chance to to read them. Are there any corrections to be made on either, or is there a motion to accept them? You're asking for a motion as to both the August and the September minutes? Yes. I think we have to do them one at a time. Right. Uh, because well, we can certainly um, do August 24th first. Is there a motion to accept or to amend? We only have four members here tonight that were there in the August meeting, so. That's a very good point of order. We really have to have unanimous One, two, vote, three, I believe. One, two, three, four. Um, there's five of us. Oh, you weren't uh, here I in August. That's right. Okay, then there are only four of those members that were present. Are there any corrections? Move to accept the minutes of the September 24th meeting as written. Is there a second? August 24th. Oh, August 24th. Second. Second. Okay, is there any discussion on that? Any corrections? There being none, all in favor? Four to zero. Yeah. Approving the minutes. 
Moving on to the minutes of September 28, 1999. Is there a motion to accept them? And this would be, there were five members. David Backer was then a member of the board and present. Um, I'll make a motion that they be approved with some corrections. Okay. We'll, we'll take the amendments in a moment. Is there a second? Second. Okay, and your corrections? Um, on page two, <coughs> from the bottom, um, it says, Mr. Fristassi stated that his concern was that the new driveway was eight feet front, should be from the abutting property at the top of the line. Um, two lines down from that, Mr. Belver stated, no, it is, should be primarily used for storage of antique cars. I believe this mm -hmm. is the correct answer. That's right. Um, on page three, um, three paragraphs up from the bottom. Uh, Mrs. Eldridge asked if the business, which was located in Cape Elizabeth before, required a conditional use. And then in the next paragraph, below that, um, the second line says, but she has only been the owner for the past, we're missing something, most of a number of years. Past blank years. Mr. Smith, do you know that information? No, but we can. I can get that. We can pull that from it. the transcript or from the other records. Okay. And those are my own proposed amendments. Okay, thank you. Are there any other amendments or corrections to the minutes? <coughs> there being none, there's a motion on the floor to approve <coughs> as amended. No further discussion. All in favor? All opposed? Mr. Cronin, are you abstaining? Yeah, I, I was not at the meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, that's right. I will abstain. Great. Okay, four to, four to zero. Four to, and with one abstention. Okay. That being done, we move on to old business. There is none listed on the agenda. Is there any old business that any members <coughs> discuss at this time. There being none, we'll move on to new business. First order of business is to hear the administrative appeal of Anthony and Julie Armstrong of 32 Lawson Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine, of Code Enforcement Officer Bruce Smith to grant building permit um, number 238 on December 13th, 1999, to Daniel and Diane Pudo of Cumberland, Maine, for their property at 31 Lawson Road. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to recuse myself on this matter. Uh, my wife is a colleague of one of these felons and uh, uh, partial relationships involved here. Okay. You may be Madam recused. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, these cases are very much uh, similar in nature. If there's no objection from the appellants uh, and if the, chair, if the board wishes, uh, I would suggest that we hear these two together. I will, I will certainly consider that in order because they are very similar. And the second one is to hear the administrative appeal of Kimberly Moody of 3 Roberts Lane, Cape Elizabeth, Maine, of the decision of Code Enforcement Officer Bruce Smith to grant building permit number 238 on December 13, 1999, to Daniel and Diane Caputo of Cumberland, Maine, for their property at 31 Lawson Road. Okay. I'd like to... Um, Confer with Mr. Secretary for me. <coughs> okay, I'll I'll first recognize um, Anthony and Julie Armstrong to come before us and to make their case for why they, they are appealing this um, decision. And after that, we'll hear from Kimberly Moody, if she is here as well, to, to um, give the arguments for, for why this has been appealed. Is your Julie Armstrong here, or someone representing them? Yes, thank you. Uh, I have prepared a, a list of exhibits and also a summary of our position. How many copies would the board like? 
Madam Chair, we need one for each member. Plus we, we've yeah. gone through this information being submitted to us at the last minute before, and I, I have to strenu strenuously object to information that should have been presented to us before. Even though I haven't seen the information, if this was something that was part of the the applicants uh, or the appellants' case, it should have been presented to us before before this time. So I would therefore um, object to anything being presented to us at this hour. That has been the way that this board has, has operated. And I would ask you to hold it um, and make your case verbally with the information that we have in front of us. We may, at some point in the future, ask for additional information from you. Well, Madam Chair, uh, there are no, I repeatedly asked for rules uh, from the Code Enforcement Office regarding uh, whether or not uh, there were procedural rules for the board. There are no procedural rules that would exclude uh, any evidence. And in fact, that is why we're here tonight, is to hear evidence uh, about this matter. Uh, so I'm not sure that I understand the board's ruling. Mr. Smith. Would I, you, would I did you clarify suggest, what the communications have been? I did suggest to the app appellants that they that they submit anything that, that may be time consuming ahead of time, but that be, unlike a variance, uh, if they chose not to do that, I don't believe we could enforce, inf enforce that situation on them because a variance is, is somewhat different. The case needs to be reviewed. The appellants are presenting a case tonight and if they choose to withhold that and, and present it all at once, I don't believe, but we might, we might want to consult with the town attorney, that it's necessarily uh, required to submit before, although I think it's somewhat advantageous. May I speak, Madam uh, Chair? I'd, I'd like to recognize the town attorney to, to make a, just a, a legal interpretation here for a moment. It is, it is For the record, state your name. And yeah, Michael Hill uh, from Monaghan Leahy, uh, representing town at Cape Elizabeth. Um, it is different than uh, a planning board where there are uh, submission requirements. Um, you have to be in uh, a rural state a certain number of days prior to. Uh, I don't have a copy of the rules with me tonight, but um, I know for submissions for variants, uh, those would have to be in with the packet that would go out to the board members so you'd have an opportunity to review it. Um, I would think that uh, in, a, in an effort or an attempt to be uh, fair to uh, all parties that uh, the appellants have the opportunity to submit the evidence that they feel will um, support their case uh, to the board. Um, and give the uh, Caputos uh, that same evidence as well. So I, I would, I would not recommend that we exclude evidence tonight, because that's how they're going to make their case. It, it <coughs> probably would have been um, uh, easier on the board if they had the evidence in, in advance of tonight's hearing. Um, I suppose if the board felt that they did not want to take it, and if, if I'm mistaken on the board's procedural rules on this issue, um, then as much as I would hate to suggest a tabling, if you, if you, you may want to table the matter and uh, have the appellant submit their, the information that they wish to uh, use to prove their case. But um, I guess I'd ask Bruce uh, Smith on the rules for the board, uh, is there a deadline, a filing deadline for submission of of the evidence. The, the, there's an application which was submitted by the Armstrongs and, right. and the other appellants. Um, I'm sorry. Moody. Kim Moody. Um, but <coughs> unlike a variance appeal, I, I could not find or do I believe that, 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 that an appellant is required to submit any more than that if they choose to, to, to submit the evidence at the time of the hearing. Right. That, that's, that's my understanding of it as well. Yeah. Maybe we should clarify this for, for future reference, but anything that's as thick as what they want to present us tonight, we won't have time to review it this evening and give it 
due consideration. And I think what we discussed uh, many months ago, many meetings, meetings ago, is to get as much information to us in advance so we can review it, read it, question it, and have uh, uh, facts available to us prior to a presentation. And that, I think and that's that was, the purpose that of was suggested to the appellate. Okay. What, right. Let's hear some discussion on the board. What What is the board's pleasure on this? I, I think this is a decision that oh. we can make in terms of whether we, it sounds like there's room to go either way. Um, I guess so. Mr. Keneally first. My feeling is that there's a strong preference, as Mr. Pistachi has indicated, that we have uh, evidence or documentation <laughs> as early as possible so we can consider it before the meeting. Uh, on the other hand, um, I, I don't think, particularly in a special case like this, we want to exclude the presentation of evidence at a meeting. Hand in hand with that, I would also say that it's going to be nearly impossible for us to review that evidence tonight. Um, but I think we should accept it, and we should study to the extent that we can, and take testimony relating to that evidence from the appellants tonight. Mr. Backer, did, did you have a comment on that? Um, I do. Um, I don't even know what the evidence is that the appellants have brought. Um, I would like to see it. Um, for all I know, it's merely copies of statutes and ordinances um, or photographs. If it is, in fact, if it's technical data or affidavits of surveyors or something that may require that we continue the hearing to, for the presentation of additional evidence another month, that may be appropriate. But it may very well be evidence that we can easily receive, review, and digest, and intelligently make a decision upon tonight. So my preference would be that we go forward. We liberally permit the presentation of any documents and testimony that the appellants want to present tonight, simply because I'm not aware of any rules that would prevent them from doing so. I would say that, as, as always, this board continues to um, be a satisfying uh, um, semi-judicial board that weighs all points of view. And I would ask if our two members would like to weigh in on this or whether we have a feeling that we'd like to hear from the town council first well, before we give them an opportunity. To add one other point is that um, you don't need to make a decision tonight. And if, if, if the information um, is voluminous and you need some time to digest it, you don't, you, you don't have to make your decision tonight. You take it under advisement and come back uh, next month uh, at the meeting. So I, I would concur with uh, what Mr. Backer said, that um, it would help the board. We don't even know what the evidence is at this point, mm -hmm. but to allow it in. And, and if it is something that you need to digest, you can uh, uh, take it under advisement. We're, is everyone? Comfortable with moving in that direction? I'm sensing sensing things going, yeah, I, going I in that direction. I feel comfortable with what the town's attorney has just mentioned, and um, with the stipulation that if we find it is too comprehensive, that we can back off for some time to review it. Um, I know, being a new member, I, I spent some time becoming acquainted with it, and if it's an introduction to, of new evidence that it has a great deal of bearing on it, it should be given equal weight. Mm -hmm. Ms. Miller? I agree. I think that going through information hastily for the purposes of satisfying the meeting isn't wise, and it'd be nice to be able to review it and make an educated decision. I, I would accept a, uh, a motion at this point to go one way or the other. I'd move we accept the evidence, uh, both the written evidence and testimony from the appellants tonight. Second. Any further discussion? All right, all in favor of going forward? Opposed? Abstentions? Is that good? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm abstaining. You're an abstention? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, we'd like to invite you back to the back to the podium at this point. Thank you. And, uh, back to my question. Um, how many copies is that then that the board Ten. needs? Ten. You can give them to Mr. Smith and he'll distribute them to us. Clarification. 
clarification um, about my conversation with Mr. Smith. He did say that anything that was particularly voluminous or um, complicated, something that was going to be time consuming, could be given to the board in advance. That was optional. Um, I think you'll find that I have put together a packet that contains both the summary of our, our position as well as uh, the evidence in a very um, logical manner. I'm going to walk through it with you. Part of the reason it's so thick is that there's a large uh, chart uh, that's folded up. There are lots of photographs. Uh, I think that you, there are lots of copies of dictionary definitions. I think you'll find that it's relatively easy to work through with potentially the exception of uh, three um, Supreme Judicial Court cases. Uh, in those cases, I have highlighted the provisions that I think are applicable. Uh, and hopefully you can get through even those without uh, too much time, but um, certainly whatever uh, the board decided in terms of, of when the matter came to a conclusion would be all right with us. Um, I, I don't know if before all this I introduced myself. I'm Julie Armstrong. Uh, my husband Anthony and I reside at 32 Lawson Road, directly across the street from 31 Lawson Road. Uh, from our property, we look over 31 Lawson Road at the ocean. And from the second story of our home, we look over the home at 31 Lawson Road at the ocean and the horizon over that. We watch the sunrise over the Caputo, the Caputo home. The proposed expansion, however, um, would block a great deal of this view. Uh, just a little background, this home, our home has been in my husband's family for 50 years. My husband grew up there. And we purchased it four years ago, spent a substantial amount of money to completely rehab it. We did that obviously on, uh, primarily on the basis of the view that it provided. And we also did so relying upon the protections of the shoreland zoning ordinance, of which we were both uh, extremely familiar with and its uh, provisions. Now obviously it goes without saying this is a very difficult situation for us. It is not pleasant to be here challenging the building permit application of our soon to be new neighbors. But we feel that we don't have any choice. Obviously whatever is built is going to be there uh, in perpetuity. And we hope to be in that home another 50 years as his parents were. So. We are concerned about the aesthetic and the financial impact of the proposed addition, but we also believe that there's a major policy issue for the town of Cape Elizabeth, and we think that it's important that the town gets it right at this point. Obviously, the shoreline is one of Cape Elizabeth's greatest assets, and the shoreline, uh, the shoreland uh, ordinance was designed to, in part, to protect visual as well as actual access to the shoreline. We have three different and three specific objections to the granting of the building permit. Uh, we'll go through them very briefly right now and then we'll get reach in detail because they're all uh, very separate. First, we believe that Mr. Smith incorrectly located the normal high water line on 31 Lost Road property, the result of which was to determine that only a part of the property was within the 75 foot setback rather than the entire structure, which we believe is in the setback area. Secondly, he incorrectly allowed the applicants to include the floor area and volume of the basement in the calculation of existing floor area and volume in violation of the ordinance. The result was a determination of existing floor area and volume substantially higher than that allowed by the ordinance. Our calculations indicate that if the appropriate normal high water line had been used and if the basement had not been considered in the calculations for volume, that the proposal, the proposed addition would, vi would violate the ordinance by exceeding the 30% provision. And finally, we believe that the zoning ordinance and state law prohibit the expansion of a structure within the shoreland setback, shoreline setback area if it would increase the nonconformity. And we believe this would increase the nonconformity for reasons that, that I will address later in the presentation. Uh, before I get into the specifics, I would like to take a moment to talk.
talk about uh, a couple of applicable legal standards established by Maine's highest court. The first being in Lewis versus the town of Rockport, which is exhibit number one. Uh, the court held that the burden of proving that a project complies with the provision of the shoreland zoning ordinance is upon the party seeking the building permit. It is not upon the party opposing approval. Obviously, in this case, we're happy to go first to put on our case. However, um, we feel it's important for the board to understand that the burden of proving uh, the, that the home does not uh, comply, the proposed addition to the home does not violate, does not comply with the ordinance is not upon us. Second, in uh, exhibit number two, MAC versus the municipal officers of the town of Cape Elizabeth, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with already. Uh, the law court held that the meaning of terms or expressions in a zoning ordinance is a matter of law. So in other words, this board must interpret the ordinance as the court did in that case, and as the court would in this case, as a matter of law. The board does not have discretion in this matter. Okay, on to the first issue. Um, as I said, we believe Mr. Smith erroneously included only a portion of the house within the setback area. Section 19-611A, which is on page 106 of the ordinance, uh, establishes the Shoreland Performance Overlay District, and it applies to, among other areas, uh, areas within 250 feet of the normal high water line of a saltwater body. And as I stated, one of the stated purposes of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District which controls the placement of structures and expansions to structures within the district is to protect the visual as well as, ac as actual access to coastal waters. Section 19-6-11E2, which is on page 108 of the ordinance, establishes the 75-foot setback from normal high water line. Now, some municipalities I'm aware of uh, have ordinances which begin to measure the setback from another standard, such as from the mean high tide or from a particular level of high tide. In other words, a still high water line. Cape Elizabeth hasn't chosen to do that. Cape Elizabeth, in its ordinance, ordinance has chosen a standard that provides much greater protection for the shoreline, and that is very significant in this case. Normal high water line of coastal waters is defined in section 1913, which is the definition section of the ordinance, and this is on page 12 of the ordinance, as that line on the shore of coastal, excuse me, of tidal waters, which is the apparent extreme limit of the effect of the tides, i.e., the top of the bank, cliff, or beach above high tide. Section 1913 also provides that all words not herein defined shall carry their customary and usual meanings. The words apparent, extreme, and limit are not defined in the ordinance, so I went to the Random House Unabridged Dictionary, which is the big unabridged dictionary at the Thomas Memorial Library. And I made copies of those as exhibit three, four, and five. Apparent is defined as readily seen, exposed to sight, open to view, visible. Extreme is defined as farthest from center or middle, outermost, endmost, and farthest, utmost, or very far in any direction. And limit is defined as the final, utmost, or furthest boundary or point as to the extent, amount, continuance, procedure, etc. Now, the 
definition of normal high water line has already been addressed by Maine's highest court in um, the case I already mentioned, which is Exhibit 2, Mac versus the town of Cape Elizabeth. In that case, the court first credited the code enforcement officer's determination that the normal high water mark was the line upon the ex was that line upon which the extreme limit of the effect of the tide is visually recognizable. That's on page 721 of Exhibit 2. The court strongly rejected the applicant's argument that the normal high water mark is the still water level of the tide itself without including the effect of waves and ocean spray. That's on 721 and 722. The court also found the record supported the code enforcement officer's determination that the protected northwesterly side of Trundy Point, for the protected side, the normal high water mark was 5 to 50 horizontal feet inland from the high water mark. But for the exposed southeasterly side of Trendy Point, the normal high water line was 16 vertical feet above the high water line on the protected northwesterly side. Okay. Now, all of Trendy Point, according to the court, only goes 22 feet above the water. Okay. So on, this, on the unprotected southeasterly side, 16 feet above, not the water, but above where the line was on the protected side. Now we would submit that as a matter of law, the seawall at 31 Lawson Road is the apparent extreme limit <coughs> of the effect of the tides. Seawall is not defined in the zoning ordinance, but is defined in the same dictionary as a strong wall or embankment to prevent the encroachment of the sea, serve as a breakwater, etc. By definition, we believe the seawall is the visible line on the shore, which is the extreme limit of the effect of the tides. Seawalls are built to prevent the ocean from encroaching any further on property, so that when you look at the seawall, that is the visible line on the shore <coughs> upon which it appears the tide can't go any further, or the effects of the tide. Now, we know that it, sometimes the tide goes over it, but what's important is when you look at the shore, what do you see? And we submit that as a matter of law, uh, it is the seawall. And because of the, the drafter's selection of the words extreme and limit within the definition of the normal high water line, it's clear that the town is not allowed to pick <coughs> one point that might be a possible normal high water line. The town is bound to pick the furthest point that looks as though that it can be affected by the tides. The geography of 31 Lost Road supports the conclusion that the seawall is the normal high water line. <coughs> the definition of normal high water line also gives the top of the bank cliff or beach above high tide as examples <coughs> of what would be a normal high water line. Um, the ordinance uses the um, uses IE, which would not suggest that those are examples. Uh, however, the court in the Mac case basically said that they really meant to use EG and that they meant those as examples. First, the shore frontage is directly open to the ocean and unprotected, like the unprotected southeasterly side of Trendy Point. In fact, it faces southeasterly. On the southwest end of the, of the seawall, there is a rock beach that goes directly up to the wall. And it is on that side that Mr. Smith found that the seawall was, in fact, the normal high water line. Now, heading northeast approximately halfway across the wall, a bank protrudes from the wall. It goes out about six feet from the wall at its widest, 
but in at least two places it totally erodes into the wall and for time it's two or three feet wide. At the end of the bank it erodes away to rock ledge directly under the seawall and I would um, ask you to look at the um, Exhibit 7, which are pictures that were taken of the property. Uh, just beyond the eroded bank is a cliff. A small cliff is approximately one foot out from the seawall, and beyond the small cliff is a steep, large cliff. Yeah, I'm sorry, you've lost me. What picture are you directing us to? Something on Exhibit 7? Okay, yes. Yeah. They're all Exhibit 7. Um, you can see that 7C is the rock beach. Then as you go further <coughs> down the property, um, we look at 7E, there is a bank. Uh, this bank is at its widest six feet from the seawall. But in a few places, it erodes back into the seawall. When, when were these pictures taken? Uh, some of them, the ones with snow, were taken relatively recently, obviously. Uh, the others were taken within the last few months, but prior to mm. snow. 7G shows uh, one of the erosions of the banks into the seawall. And, and it shows then how it, it uh, turns into a cliff. And you can see from 7H, the steep cliff beyond the seawall. May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. On picture 7E, which shows- Excuse uh, me, did you say E? 7E, mm -hmm. as in Edward. Um, the fact that a, some significant part of the bank on the ocean side of the seawall is still snow covered might imply to me that high tide has not touched that part of the land. Is that at variance with your interpretation? That's true. The normal, the still water high tide does not, would not ever go to that point. In fact, um, on exhibit seven, exhibit eight or exhibit nine, um, the high, the 10 foot high water line has, was plotted by uh, a representative of the Caputos. For the, for the purposes of moving the meeting along, I'd like to ask members to hold their questions and could you move it along to the end of your, um, Arguments, sure. please. And then we'll come back for questions <coughs> those things. It appears to us the line drawn by Mr. Smith is arbitrary. It contains <coughs> something. 16 feet out from the sea wall, there is nothing on the shore. Uh, that would make that point the apparent extreme limit of the effect of the tides. Uh, aside from the seawall itself, the rock beach, and the eroded bank, there are other visible indications on the shore that the effects of the tide are felt above the, the line drawn by Mr. Smith. I recently observed sea glass, shells, smoothed rocks, driftwood, and a mangled lobster trap inland of that 16 foot mark that Mr. Smith identified as the normal high water line. Now in exhibit eight, <coughs> which was submitted with the building permit application, it shows a line that was drawn at 21 feet out and it states that it was that line is determined by the code official, Cape Elizabeth. Ultimately, however, Mr. Smith made the line five feet inland. Uh, I guess I'm not sure why, and uh, we would be interested in hearing a complete explanation of that for the first time.
Now, in the Mapp case, where the court agreed that the protected northwesterly side of Trundy Point, um, that the water, normal high water line was 5 to 15 feet inland, the court agreed that the unprotected southeasterly side, like the 31 Lawson Road property, the normal high water line was 16 vertical feet higher than that. But Mr. Smith would have us believe that the normal high water line at the unprotected southeasterly 31 Lawson Road is, is only 16 feet out from the seawall, which was built to protect against encroachment from the sea. Uh, and that line, it appears to me, is, was, is approximately eight or nine vertical feet above the still high tide level. Uh, the sea does periodically come up or even over the seawall, uh, according to uh, former resident James Cusack. And at Exhibit 10 is an affidavit from Mr. Cusack telling you that um, there have uh, been times when the water <coughs> is, has been over the seawall. He's had debris in his backyard. Let's uh, continue. Exhibit 11C, uh, Exhibit 11A and B shows seawater and large sea debris up to the side door at 31 Lawson Road. Those are old photographs, obviously. And Exhibit 11C shows just how large the surf can get there. Now, I think it's compelling that uh, when we try to look at where the normal high water line would have been had there been no seawall. We have located the 1939 plot plan for the neighborhood that was done by a civil engineer and filed with the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. And uh, it was drawn before the house was built and before the seawall was built. And the engineer plotted in that case, in that on that plan, the mean high tide, and he also plotted the top of the bank. Lawson Road of property. And as you can see, this was prepared by um, civil engineer Otto Stevenson, uh, 1939. And he has plotted around the entire neighborhood the mean high water mark, and he has also plotted the top of the bank. And that top of the bank is very close to the location of the existing seawall. The top of the bank is the language that is used by the ordinance defining normal high water line. Please continue. And, and in the interest of time, I, you brought a lot of new information to this, and we certainly appreciate it, and it will take some time for the members to go through it um, on their own. So could you please bring this to the end of of your information, and you know that we'll be having questions and we'll be absorbing it. I will go as quickly as possible, but this is our opportunity to create a record um, that, and it's our only opportunity to create a record on which to have these issues decided. Yes, and you've done a wonderful job of documenting it in paper as well, and I thank you for that. I will move as quickly as possible, and I thank you for suggesting that the board will uh, cautiously in carefully look over the material. Um, I also put in the picture of Fort Williams uh, as the rocks and the cliffs there, just by way of comparison, to say that, that if the board were applying the same standard to Fort Williams, we would hope that the normal high water line would be at the top of the bank, at the top of the cliffs, uh, up by uh, the very top, despite the fact that there's a lot of vertical feet between the water 
and that point is clearly what the drafters had in mind. And we suggest that you do the same thing for 31 Lawson Road. Now on the second issue, the issue of the basement. Um, as I said, Mr. Smith allowed them to calculate the floor area and volume of the below grade floor. Uh, section 1944B1A of the ordinance, which is on page 36 and 37, provides that that portion of a structure within the 75 foot setback shall not be expanded in floor area or volume by more than 30% during the lifetime of the structure. Volume is defined by reference to the definition of floor area, and the definition of floor area specifically excludes basement. I think we're all in agreement that a basement is excluded, but the, the issue is whether or not the below grade floor in this house constitutes basement. The word basement, unfortunately, is not defined in the zoning ordinance. And as I stated before, the zoning ordinance said that any word that's not defined shall carry its customary and usual meaning. Basement is defined in the dictionary as a story of a building partly or wholly underground. That's exhibit 13. This basement is a basement by any definition of the word basement. It is partly underground, in other words, below grade. It's part of the substructure of the house. The foundation of the building constitutes a portion of the walls of the basement. The finished floor of the basement is entirely below grade except for the stairway entrance platforms. Upon entering the front and side door, it is necessary to distance, descend stairs to enter the level. The furnace, oil tank, and other typical basement things are located there. The ocean side of the house is entirely below ground. The kitchen, dining room, and living room are in the story above this level. It is a basement by the customary and usual meaning of that word. The town of Cape Elizabeth has consistently classified this space as basement for tax assessment purposes. And Exhibit 14 uh, shows you that. Just to make sure that wasn't a fluke, I went and looked at a lot of similarly situated houses. I looked at over a dozen houses. And uh, the town const uh, calls the lower level of those houses a basement also. Moreover, the real estate broker who listed this property for sale and through whom the Caputos purchased the property described this below grade level as basement. The multiple listing classified this level as basement. That is exhibit 16. The applicants knew what they were buying when they bought 31 Lawson Road and the low level was a basement. By real estate appraisal standards, this is a basement. Exhibit 17 is a, an affidavit by a licensed uh, real estate appraiser showing that, that constitutes a basement. And even the plans prepared by the Caputo's architect showed, show that the first floor is start, starts at zero feet, zero inches, and that what they refer to as a ground floor uh, is labeled as being at a grade of minus seven feet and eight inches, thereby treating it like a basement regardless of what it's called. Now the applicants assert that the reason that this is not a basement is because it meets the definition under the BOCA, the, the building code adopted by Cape Elizabeth as a story above grade. But the BOCA code adopted by the town actually supports our position. The code defines basement also, and it says basement is that portion of a building which is partly or completely below ground. And that is nearly identical to the customary definition of basement. <coughs> and we think they missed the point when they say that because it might qualify as a story above grade for certain purposes under the building code, that makes it not a basement. In fact, the Boca Code doesn't say if it, if it meets these criteria, it's not a basement. It says a basement shall be considered a story above grade if it meets one of these criteria. And 
finally, in um, the case of Camplin versus the town of York, which is Exhibit 18, Maine's highest court <coughs> held that it was improper for the town to look to the building code adopted by the town to define a term that wasn't in the zoning ordinance. It said that undefined terms needed to be given their common and generally accepted meaning, and that you couldn't fill in a missing term in the zoning ordinance by reference to a definition in the building code. So in conclusion, 31 Lawson Road is a basement by any definition of the word basement. Its floor area and volume should not have been calculated as part of existing floor area and volume. And that when you consider uh, that and the, and the normal high water line should be at the seawall, the applicants exceed 30% in volume. Finally, um, and I will be very brief on this point, um, section 1944B1, which is page 36 of the ordinance, deals with the enlargement of non-conforming buildings and structures within the Shoreland Performance Overlay District. And it says that a non-conforming structure may be added to or expanded after obtaining a permit from the code enforcement officer, provided that such addition or expansion does not increase the non-conformity of the structure. And Maine's highest court recently, in a case named Lewis versus Rockport, which is Exhibit 1, had occasion to interpret very similar language to that in the town of Rockport. Uh, Mr. Smith, you occupy this building most often. Does that have a significance? <laughs> sounded let's a bit let's like let it happen a, once more. <laughs> sounded a bit like a fire alarm, but it seems to have stopped. Uh, please continue. First, the court said that since the spirit of zoning ordinances is to restrict rather than to increase nonconformity, <coughs> provisions of a zoning regulation for the continuation of nonconformities should be strictly construed. And that is highlighted, and it's on page 1049 of Exhibit 1. The court then flatly rejected the town's limit of nonconformance theory. The town's theory was that as long as the expansion didn't place the structure any further into the setback area than it already was, it didn't increase the nonconformity. And the court held that giving the term no more nonconforming, it's common and generally accepted meeting, and strictly construing that language, any modification of or addition to a building that would increase the square footage or volume or square footage of nonconforming space within the building even if it didn't increase the linear extent of nonconformance, makes the building more nonconforming. Accordingly, the court found that it violated the provision prohibiting expansion that increases nonconformity. According to that court's holding, then, the applicant's plan to increase the square footage and volume of the existing nonconforming structure does increase the nonconformity of the structure and is prohibited by section 1944B1. Uh, there does then appear to be a conflict between that and the 30% provision, but the ordinance itself uh, assumes that there may be conflicts and provides how to deal with them. And in Article 10, Section 1910.1, which is on page 198 of the ordinance, the section uh, provides that whenever a provision <coughs> of this ordinance is inconsistent with another provision of the ordinance or any other ordinance, regulation, or statute, the more restrictive and specific provision shall control. So to the extent that there is a conflict, we would suggest that uh, the provision uh, prohibiting increasing the nonconformity is more restrictive and should control. In fact, the provision allowing or seeming to allow for additions or expansions is specifically says it's subject to the restriction that it not increase the nonconformity. And finally, uh, state law has a very similar provision uh, prohibiting expansions within the shoreland zone that would increase the nonconformity. So we would suggest that state law would also be violated. Uh, I'm done with my presentation. Um, I would be happy to answer any other questions. My husband wants to speak briefly to provide some 
um, information he has. He obviously has a lot of uh, personal knowledge about the property since he was um, born and brought up and, and raised um, on Lawson Road. Um, and he will briefly conclude, and that will be the conclusion of our presentation. That, that would be fine. We could have a brief statement from Mr. Armstrong and then move on. But there will, I think there probably will be questions. So. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Um, my name is Anthony Armstrong. I live at the 32 Lawson Road. And uh, I simply want to relate, uh, as a matter of evidence, uh, my experiences on a couple of occasions, several occasions, growing up in this home for, well, I lived there for about 25 years, and then obviously I've come back 20 years later and lived there 20 to 25 years later and now live there again. But uh, there have been numerous times over that period, over that period where the surf has come up over the top of the bank, and uh, uh, particularly behind the garage, but also in the area in front of the house. And I think that it's, even though there's a lot of evidence being submitted there and a couple of those pictures might have gotten lost in the shuffle, it's crucial that you observe those small, older pictures that show tidal water, where tidal water and the snow has been in around the house. And it's also important that you uh, read Mr. Cusack's affidavit. Uh, one of the items that Mr. Cusack related to us in the affidavit, is related to us and in the, stated in the affidavit as well, is that the seawater on three occasions came into his basement and flooded the basement uh, at that lowest level. Uh, so, uh, and I would also just want to put on the record my personal experience in observing the surf and seawater coming into that level and also observing it coming over uh, the seawall uh, as a youth. The second matter, I, I'm just doing it on, on an anticipatory basis. I think that probably some of the evidence you'll hear tonight is that there's some, some grass on the outside of the seawall in, uh, in front of the home, uh, particularly in front of the, the home that's the part of the home that's uh, going to be ex uh, uh, expanded. Um, I just can relate to you that when I was a child, over the years, it was fairly common practice. It was common practice for the owner of that property, Mr. Chapman, and I know the successors of that home did it as well, to dump their lawn cuttings, lawn mowing, uh, lawn mowing scraps over the edge of the wall. So where there is some grass there, and it's a very small strip, maybe in one place, maybe a foot and a half wide, uh, that's the result of people dumping fertilizer and grass over the edge and uh, there's just a little of it hearing there but basically uh, as my wife described uh, uh, I, I think it's pretty clear that this is the the seawall is the line that comports with the definition that the court uh, the law court adopted in the in the Mac case finally I'd like to just mention one uh, area of expertise uh, I own a mortgage uh, company and I deal with uh, appraisers all the time and I deal with situations where we're trying to get people loans. And uh, all the lending authorities, including the one referenced in Mr. Doherty's uh, affidavit, which you have, um, uh, strictly construe these basement areas. Even if there's, uh, you know, there are rooms in those areas, they're considered basements, and they're not considered in the living area as, as adding any significant value to the property, even if they're finished space. If they are, below grade, as is, as is described in Mr. Doherty's affidavit. So uh, I just wanted to add my expertise to that uh, bit of uh, information that was presented earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I believe we might have some, some questions. Before we do, I'd like to ask Mr. Smith to just clarify one question that did come up regarding exhibits eight and nine and the, the dates of when the 21-foot high water mark was established as opposed to the 16-foot one. My initial determination was at 21 feet, and I still believe that I could defend that. But based on the, on the plotted NGVD of, of, of 10 and a revisit of the site, uh, I felt that, that, that I could defend 100% the 16-foot high-water mark, although I 
believe that 90, 98 percent, 97 percent uh, of defense on the 21, I felt 3 percent uncomfortable, if you may put it that way. And that's why I decided to call the high water mark at 16 feet uh, for, for 100 percent comfort level. The 21 foot was not a document that, that was used to issue this building permit because it was, it was not a firm determination. Okay. Um, and therefore, it's not in our records. Thank you. Members of the board, questions, comments? Just as a uh, procedural question, should we have the co- um, Appellant. Appellant make her a case and then um, reviewed each item separately before we start asking questions which might confuse some of us. I'd like I'd like to if take the I'd like to take the high the, the I'd like to take the high water line uh, as a separate issue and then the basement as a separate issue and discuss keep the discussion on, on each uh, each of those issues. We'll um, also be hearing um, from the Caputos as well. That's correct. I hope so, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Does anyone object to moving on to Kimberly Moody, the second appellant? And then, Kimberly Moody, please come to the to the podium and, and identify yourself. Yes, I'm Kimberly Moody. I live on 3 um, Roberts Lane, which is um, also, or had been previously known as 22 Lawson Road. Um, I have lived um, at that address for five years and have relatives who've lived in Cape Elizabeth, Jim Moody, um, for over 20 years. Um, I had a big investment, as I'm, I'm sure you can understand, in um, purchasing that home and knowing that there were ocean views. Um, so I'm here um, partly out of um, my own concern about the loss of um, the sunrise coming up over the ocean that will be obliterated with this proposed expansion, um, but also a grave concern about what this might mean in the future for other similar cases. So there's a lot resting, and I know that you're well aware of that on your determination tonight. Um, I want the board to know also that we did submit, or I know I did, and I, um, I'm under the impression that the Armstrong submitted a letter <coughs> with these complaints as soon as we heard about um, the proposal. But um, Mr. Smith obviously um, you know, has reason to um, believe that, that it should have been approved. I don't agree with him, and I think that he's made some important mistakes that we need to note. Um, I have a letter here to read, but I'm not sure about the procedure, so I, um, I'll need some advice on that. This is from a, a neighbor who lives in front of me. Her name is Rita Yarnold. You're certainly yeah, welcome to read it now, and then you can give it and to us. To you. Okay, thank you. Um, Rita Yarnold lives um, at 24 Lawson Road, and her house is beside ours and also um, will be affected by this um, expansion. Dear Chairman, my name is Rita Yarnold, and I am the owner of 24 Lawson Road. Unfortunately, un I am unable to attend tonight's meeting. However, I would like to express my concerns about the addition to the Caputo home <clears throat> at 31 Lawson Road. The east side of my home has ocean views, as well as a view from the front side of the Caputo home. When I bought 24 Lawson Road in 1980, I chose the house strictly because of its views and setting. I am concerned that although I've been taxed on the views and setting for nearly 20 years, I may now lose some of my views due to the proposed addition to the Caputo home. For the record, I write not as a disgruntled neighbor, but as a real estate professional who has owned and operated a local real estate firm for 15 years and who comprehends Maine real estate law. It is my understanding that by law, the town of Cape Elizabeth is required to strictly construe the mandated language pertaining to the expansion of a non-conforming property. I urge you to regard this language very seriously and uphold your obligation not to limit in this or any other similar situation visual access to the ocean and shoreline. Sincerely, Rita Young. Yeah. Give it to Mr. <coughs> okay, a lot of what I have to say, you have heard much more eloquently than I could ever present. It's a night when I wish I were a lawyer. Um, I have similar um, reasons for objecting. 
First is this issue about the uh, shoreline. <clears throat> I think that the important thing for me to reiterate is that I believe Mr. Smith has made a mistake and he has used the still water level. I haven't heard his explanation yet, but um, that is not the level that should have been used. And I agree that the seawall is the normal high water line in this case because it is the furthest extent extreme of the reach of the high tide. And I can say that I've been down there, although I haven't seen it come over the high, the, the um, seawall. I have seen it reach the seawall during the stormy days. So I don't have any pictures, just have my, my own experience. And that is, I think, and I won't refer to a Mac case or anything, but I think that, that is very clear. Second, I think that the application should have been denied because it would increase the nonconformity of the structure. I would use the same argument, argument again that the Armstrong so eloquently have um, forwarded, but that they have made a mistake in calculating the volume of that basement. And I think that you've heard a lot of evidence about that, that it was um, considered a basement in all of the taxation assessing of the town, that it has been considered a basement in previous owners um, applications for um, changes and additions. It has been considered a basement by the real estate agent who listed the home, and by all common purposes, you would also, if you went in, think of it as a basement. So, given that, when you have recalculated, then the proposal has exceeded the 30% expansion. Um, I guess I want to just say in conclusion that we're grateful for the town's ordinances, protects our shoreline and our visual access to the ocean. We urge you to make a decision on this application that carries out the intent of our ordinances. Any questions? Thank you very much. I'd like to ask the Caputos to come forward and give, give the other point of view, and then we'll have a fuller discussion with Mr. Yes. We've, we've heard from the two appellants, and we'd like now to hear from you. First of all, I'm sorry I hired architects and interior decorators. I should have talked to Mrs. Armstrong. She knows every room in that house better than anybody I've talked to. Uh, unbelievable. To me, a basement, where you can, you can walk right out of the door outside, even with the room you're in, that's not a basement. So I don't know. A realtor might put all kinds of things on a, on a listing. I don't know how you call that a basement. I, I just want to... Uh, Briefly, I have my architect here and the attorney to <coughs> speak about the law, if that's what you want to hear. I bought this house, <clears throat> first of all, I didn't inherit it. <clears throat> I uh, earned every nickel that I had to buy it from. It took me 50 years to earn this kind of money. I bought the house after uh, I was given 10 days to prove that we could expand in a way to make the house livable for my wife and I. I saw the code enforcer. I asked him what the rules were. I bought the code. I then hired a professional architect who's built homes on Shore Road. I then went and got a hydrologist, a, uh, a surveyor, to tell me where the high, high water mark was. When you start using subjective words like effective high tide, the hydrologist told me you could call Cumberland. Cumberland's affected by the high tide in Cape Blue. So maybe Cumberland's the high water mark. Those are, that's a very subjective sentence, the effect of the high water mark. Uh, after hiring all these professionals, working up plans for the building. I went back to the code enforcer. Before I sign this deed, before I buy this property, this is what we've done. Am I on the right track? And I don't want to put Mr. Smith in the wrong. He didn't tell me I'm going to defend you. You can do anything you want to do. He says, yes, you are. You're following the rules completely. This is the way I see it. You followed the local rules You've, because Cape Elizabeth has no other. You followed what the experienced architect has built many homes along the shore has said. There is a, a stream of rose bushes right outside of that seawall, as healthy as anything of you have ever seen. And the hydrologist said, you understand how rose bushes could grow that healthy sitting in, in high water. So that, and there's pictures of them. And one of these pictures here, I have some pictures of them also. Uh, but as I said, I followed. I took the advice of professionals. I followed the rules completely on what I was supposed to do before I put the final down payment on the house. Uh, I went further 
after I found out I was going to be challenged, and incidentally, there's something I really have to tell you I resent here tonight, to bring six inches of documents from my husband and wife, who are both attorneys, who told us four months ago they were fighting us, and to bring him here tonight and to lay him before you, hoping either to stall it or table it or I don't know what to do, just don't seem to me playing fair. I mean, they, Mr. Armstrong called my architect in November, November, to let him know that he was going to fight this. And tonight, they bring you a pile of documents that tall and tell you this is our evidence. Maybe feeling if we had a time to study it, and Mrs. Armstrong, I found out, sits home all day and had a lot, a lot of time to present this. But that's true, isn't it? That is not true. <laughs> that, that's nothing to do with the case, so let's All right. We have two working lawyers who please have four please months, continue with your presentation who have four months to present documents uh, supporting their case, and they did not do it. They chose to bring them here tonight, uh, which puts us in a hell of a uh, situation right now. Anyway, I went ahead and sold my other home. Uh, we've had a all kinds of delays. I had to go back to my architect. We're going to be challenged. Is there any other way we could do this? I went to my lawyer. Tell me what I should do. I came back to see the code enforcer. Is there anything else I can do here to, uh, you know, you're following everything that we know you're doing according to the rules. My house has been sold. I've got to get out of here in a few months. I know you don't care about the wonderful bridge mortgage I'm going to pay for as many months as this goes on. But uh, I, I just don't understand how you can buy a piece of property in good faith, follow the rules of every professional you hire and do exactly what you're told, and then to be told that you're destroying the shoreland and uh, we're going to prevent this if we can. And when, again, I've had no real time to even know what this, what this case was being presented against us. Uh, I would like now, I've said what I have to say, I'd like David Loy, who was an architect with Archetype here, who did all the calculations, who worked up uh, uh, the, both the volume, the, uh, the square footage, uh, to come to uh, the conclusions he did. Thank you. Certainly. Good evening. I'll be brief. I mean, I've submitted all my calculations. My name is David Loy. I'm a registered architect. I've been practicing in Maine for 25 years. I just want to say that uh, Mr. Caputo, just like he said, before he purchased the, uh, the house, he, he, he came to me and he said, I, I want to uh, make sure that what I need to do here is within the letter of the ordinance. So we carefully checked, we hired surveyors, we uh, brought out uh, Mr. Smith to determine high watermarks. Uh, I carefully went through all the calculations. I've done this on numerous houses along the coast of Maine. Uh, we're well within the, uh, well, much lower than the 30% of volume and square footage. Uh, I've submitted the, you know, the documentation on, on a, uh, what is a basement and what is not a basement. And I'm, I'm an architect. I can only, I can only read the ordinance and then I'll go to any definition of anything in a building has to come under BOCA, which is our national building code, which is adopted here. And, and BOCA tells me if I was designing this house, that that is not a basement. Uh, and there's nothing else to go on. You don't go to a real estate guide. You don't go to a Webster's Dictionary. You go, you go, to, you go to your national building code. Um, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you'd like. Thank you. Is there anyone, excuse me, this is not a dialogue time. Um, is there anyone else on uh, with the Caputos who would like to make a presentation? I'm John McVeigh. I'm the attorney for uh, Dan Caputo, and I just wanted to uh, give some, I realize that you'll be relying on your own counsel for legal advice, but I do want to give the other side of the legal picture. Um, the case law that uh, has been cited to you is uh, hardly uh, uh, case law that dictates a, uh, a, a specific result. Uh, the Mac case dealt with a situation in which you essentially had had the sea approaching a, a vertical cliff and maybe the tide stopped here but you didn't have the kind of rise and vegetation you had here and the law court quite properly said look let's get real where does the property start it starts you know where, where, where does the effect of the tide stop start it stops here at the top of the cliff that that's sort of a no-brainer here you have a gradual incline and, uh, you know, as Mr. Armstrong said, uh, they've been dumping grass seed down here. 
for 30 years. Well, it's still there, and it's growing. And as Mr. Keneally indicated, well, the snow is still there. And as Mr. Caputo indicated, there's lots of land inside that gets a touch of salt water in Maine. That's not what we're talking about because the law in your ordinance says, where does the effect of the tide stop? Not where does the last drop of salt water hit when the wind blows hard. The effect stops where you can see it, where it is obvious. Where is the obvious effect? Where does the effect of the tides stop in these pictures? Well, you go take a look and you make a judgment of fact based on evidence presented to you. It's not dictated, the case law doesn't say if you see a seawall, that has to be where the high water line marks. Maybe they built the seawall back a little bit because they found some nice structure in the rocks that would support it. If, wherever everybody places a seawall does not automatically mean that's where the high tide, the effect of the tide ends. That means perhaps it was a reasonable place for construction of the wall. That has nothing to do with the placement of this wall but where the effect of the tide ends. The case, the map case cited to you, which does interpret the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance, dealt with a specific fact situation when you had a piece of property where it was obvious where the effect of the tide ended. That's not obvious here, and you're entitled to make a factual determination based on the evidence before you about where the effect stops. <coughs> Mr. Smith has made his conclusions. Uh, He's had received evidence. Um, you, you can see uh, vegetation growing there. It's obviously not being wiped away by the tides for decades. Where does the effect stop? That's the factual determination. Nothing in the Mac case dictates that you decide, oh, there's a seawall, therefore, that's the extreme effect of the high tide. Um, Sorry, I'm really disorganized, but I didn't uh, expect to get this pile. Um, the Rockport case. The Rockport case that you've incited talks about, dealt with a, I can't, I don't have a blackboard here, so I can't draw it. But imagine an L-shaped building where the tip of the L is the piece of the building that pokes over the setback. The owner of that building wanted to take the tip of that L and expand it and build a wall all the way down the rest of the line of the L. So he would have increased the footprint of the building, thus increasing the intrusion of the entire building into the setback beyond what was originally there and grandfathered to a property line, not the not not the high water mark. That's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm moving off to another subject. Yeah. Um, that was what, that was the increase of the non-conformity in that case. And the law court properly held, you can't enlarge a non-conforming structure and change the footprint so the footprint of the building intrudes more into the setback than the grandfather used it. The footprint in this project doesn't change at all. There is no change in the footprint. There is therefore no increase in the nonconformity. Also, to adopt the interpretation that the Armstrongs have, been given, have given you about this ordinance, that is, you can expand the ordinance less than, you can expand a nonconforming structure less than 30%, but you can't increase the nonconformity. And the argument is, well, you can't increase the nonconformity, therefore, any expansion must increase the nonconformity, therefore you can't expand. Well, that makes nonsense of the ordinance. And it makes nonsense of the state statute. Okay? And when you do statutory interpretation, you try to give meaning to all the elements of the statute <coughs> and the ordinance. We have an ordinance and a statute here that says you can expand for less than 30% as long as you don't increase the nonconformity. How do we make that a reality? How do we say, how do we have our expansion and not increase uniformity at the same time. I submit to you that the answer is, comes from looking at the Rockport case. You can increase the footprint, but you can increase the volume. 
That way, you expand the building that is a nonconforming structure, but you don't expand the nonconformity. And that's exactly what this ordinance contemplates. And by interpreting the ordinance that way, you give effect to both pieces of the ordinance. <clears throat> you can expand, but don't increase the nonconformity, instead of one piece, which is what the Armstrongs want, don't increase the nonconformity. That they would have would overwhelm any right to expand when the ordinance itself and the state statute expressly gives the owner of a nonconforming structure the right to expand. Somehow. <coughs> um, on, the, uh, on the basement issue, uh, frankly, I haven't had time to react to the Camplin case, but the town has adopted the Boca Code. Uh, everyone knows that different definitions are used for different purposes. Tax guys use definitions for one reason. <coughs> Uh, you know, there, there are all kinds of different uh, ways of describing what a basement is. You will find in the Boca Code that this uh, base, so-called basement is more than 50% of upgrade, and under the code that has been adopted by the town, it is not a basement. Um, if you give the ordinary meaning uh, of basement, to something that is, ab that is mostly above ground and that you walk in and out of and see daylight in, I submit to you that even under an ordinary meaning uh, conception, this doesn't count as a basement. Uh, I guess I'll wait for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is that it from the, the Caputo presentations? All right. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this that has not already spoken? All right, then uh, please come to the microphone and identify yourself. Uh, my name is Priscilla Armstrong. I'm obviously related to the Armstrongs, and I live at 18 Avon Road. But I am speaking to the point of the vegetation below the seawall. I am a professional gardener and I have taken marine biology at SMTC, so I know the types of plants that can live below a seawall. And if any of you have ever walked at uh, Crescent Beach State Park, which I'm sure most of you have, you will know that Rosa rugosa, uh, goldenrod, um, sea vetch, and various other grasses grow and are customarily flooded by high tides. So the argument that there can be plants growing below the sea ground, sea wall that would not be affected by high tide is incorrect. And I would also like to point out, which this is purely personal, Mr. Armstrong did not inherit that house. He purchased it. Thank you for your commentary. Is there anyone else who would like to offer testimony? And I'll declare this part of the hearing closed and open it up to board members uh, to ask questions or to uh, have discussion. Can we ask uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Smith to present uh, his my comments on, on this particular case? You had the application. and Could you take us through the steps? Did I what the last? I'd like to hear from you as to how this application got to this point, or this building permit got to this point. Um, before I do that, could I comment on a few points made by the appellants briefly? Yes. yes. Um, uh, just, just for the record, uh, I'd like to point out that uh, at no point in the discussions with the applicants for a building permit, the Caputos, did I agree that the still water line was to be determined as the high water line. Nor did I compromise with an applicant because I would be compromising my job. So I'd like to clarify the record uh, in that respect. Miss um, Armstrong mentioned that, that, that uh, clearly the ordinance states that the top of the bank is the high water mark. But my interpretation of the ordinance, when it says IE, that means as an example. And pardon the pun, it's not necessarily set in stone. Okay? She also mentioned that a town called's basement 
a lower level. The town assessor has his own terms, definition for assessment purposes only, which has nothing to do with code. So the town assessor's records may point to that being called a basement, but it's a separate and distinct issue from code enforcement. Um, she also made a comment that, 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 that basements, for lack of a definition, should be the common and generally accepted meaning. Um, clearly, if we don't, if we, if we go to, if we don't use the bulk of building code and we go to the, the shoreland zone definition, which is a state mandated minimum guideline, it says any portion of a structure with a floor to ceiling height of six feet or more, or having more than 50% of its volume below the existing ground level. That is less stringent than the Boca definition. And therefore, by using the Boca definition, I believe that, that we're following the minimum state mandated guidelines. Um, and I don't believe there's any violation um, by issuance of the permit. Bruce, um, do you have a Boca definition there? What's that? Do you have the Boca definition there? The Boca definition and the state definition are in the, my I'm, I'm confused, I have to admit. I hope I'm not the only one, but. Okay. I, both parties have asserted that the Boca definition supports their cases in terms of what a basement is or isn't. And Boca definition um, defines a basement as a, that portion of a building which is partly or completely below grade, and in parentheses it says C story above grade. Story above grade is defined as any story having its finished floor surface entirely above grade, except that a basement shall not be considered as a story above grade where the finished surface of the floor above the basement is and is three condition. It meets condition two, more than six feet above the finished ground level for more than 50% of the total building perimeter. The figures submitted by the architect supports the fact that it meets the bulk of definition, which is more stringent than the state mandatory guidelines. Mr. Smith, it would be helpful for you to make copies of that available to the board. Um, the, in the, 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 you have this. Is, you have the, you have the responses, okay. yes. Um, just to clarify some points on the Lewis versus Rockport. Um, those non-conforming setbacks um, in that particular situation was to property lines and not to the shoreland high watermark. I think it's clear that this ordinance is, 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 the same, is, in, is one and the same. We do not allow expansions of nonconforming structures within a setback. But the, it clearly follows the 30% expansion rule within a 75-foot setback from the high watermark uh, parallels what the intent of the original shoreland zoning mandatory guidelines says that a, that a town can do. So you can, I believe, you can expand either way and upwards within 75 feet, providing you do not go closer. In your packets, I did, I did include a picture of, of, of that situation. Mm -hmm. although, the, although the setback shows 100 feet, because it's to do with great ponds, just pretend like that figure is 75 feet to the ocean, and it clearly allows 30% expansion. Um, another point um, about seawater, uh, yes, it can and does flood. It floods roads, it floods buildings under, during extreme conditions, uh, but I don't believe it was the intent of this ordinance to regulate um, uh, land that's occasionally affected by storm surges and that easily supports terrestrial vegetation, which is the case in this, in this particular instance. Um, Something that Ms. Moody brought up was, was um, to do with views. And, and unfortunately, there's nothing in the ordinance that allows me to, to in, enforce uh, the loss of a view. Uh, so I don't think that's an issue that, that, that neither I nor the board should consider. And my final point on, 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 on what I heard from the appellants is that the still water level meaning what we call the normal high water line, which in this particular area is 10 feet, 
NGVD, which is 10 feet above the figure that everybody uses, zero, um, is some 14 to 30 feet seaward of where I determined the high water mark to be. Um, so I think we're much more conservative even at 16 feet than what the state would allow an applicant to do had we adopted the state mandatory definition, which is the normal high water line still water. So I think the intent of the ordinance is met because we are quite a bit conser more conservative. Um, so that's my point. Um, I don't know how much you want me to get into what I've already submitted since you've had time to review this. Um, I can read this. Why don't, why don't we just go on the basis of questions okay. on that? And I, I would uh, ask if, if there are questions of Mr. Smith or other information that people would like. Getting to, back to my original question, when they came in to uh, make an application, um, did you ask them to go back out and have a professional engineer or surveyor determine where the high water line was? Or did you go out and do your visual at that particular time? I initially met at the site and walked the site. And at that point, to establish the record and, and to be firm, on firm ground with my, with my call, I asked them to, to get a surveyor to determine the high water mark based on NGVD 1929, which is the standard for every, every normal high water mark. Was your determination of the high water line more restrictive than, um, I believe it was Dan Delfonso's? Yes, by 14 to 30 feet upwards of that normal high water mark, depending on where you measure. Okay, and all the calculations that were done were done with your uh, determination of the high water line uh, as opposed to Dan Delfonso's. So yours, right. so yours then, would your, your calculations are more restrictive than the uh, surveyor that they that they hired that's correct which which we do that that would happen if if they and again for further clarification if they use dan delfonso's determination then that 75 foot line would be seawood and it would include all the basement if they use dan delfonso's none of the house would be in within 75 feet at all that would that's, be totally outside that's the point i wanted to that's be correct. yes that's the point i want to be made that's correct all right, then I'm, I'm satisfied. Are there other comments or questions? I, I will admit to being confused, feeling confused still about a number of issues here. Um, and I just, I had made notes here that both parties had referred to the Boca definition of basement to support their case. And so I guess I would like to ask Mrs. Armstrong uh, to sort of clarify your use of the Boca definition to support your case. Well, for starters, I wouldn't suggest that you use the Boca code uh, because it's not applicable to this case, as the court clearly stated in the Camplin case. What I did say that, ironically, the, they assert, assert that the Boca code supports them, but if you did look at it, which you should not do, it supports us because it defines basement to clearly include their lower level. I, I still need, I need to stress that one more <clears throat> time, the fact that that definition is more stringent than the state minimum guidelines for determination of a basement. And if we and if we, we, we backed off to the state definition for lack of another definition, this, the, the, then it would still be considered not a basement for the purposes of calculations. We are we are required by law, mandated by law, to have at least the minimum guidelines. We can be more stringent but not as but not less. So even if we back off the BOCA, we're going to have to at least use the state definition, and it does fit the state definition. Um, Mr. Backer. Ms. Armstrong, over here. Could you respond to Mr. Smith's comments on the state ordinance? 
yes. as a fallback definition as to whether or not you think that's appropriate? The court's decisions are clear that you don't look to some other uh, definition in some other code or law that if the ordinance itself, in other words, the zoning ordinance of Cape Elizabeth doesn't contain a definition, you look to the customary and usual definition. That's not necessarily, it isn't a definition that's found in some other code. It's the definition uh, that's used out there in the world. It's the definition we find in the dictionary. Uh, it's the definition that people apply. How how does the municipal shoreland zoning ordinance fit into this in providing the definition for basement? Either one of you, if you can comment on that. It, it I, I'm not sure I understand how that how that ordinance how that statute rather fits into this. The um, <laughs> the zoning ordinance and the building code are two separate things. Mr. Smith talked about the tax assessor having their own rules and having their own standards. Well, I would submit to you that similarly, the building code is a separate code and it is not incorporated into the zoning ordinance. Um, I think it's tempting for people to look for other definitions because we don't have one in the zoning ordinance. But we can't do that. The courts have said we need to look to the customary and usual definition. Mr. Smith. The, the, the whole crux of a shoreland zoning ordinance is based on the fact that, that it was it's a requirement from the state, a mandated situation whereby towns have to adopt shoreland zoning at least as stringent as what the minimum guidelines say they have to be. And if we don't, then we would have would, would automatically be mandated, legislated by the state. We'd be it would be forced down our throats. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So therefore, we elected to create our own shoreland zoning. <clears throat> that isn't a code; it's a mandate. For lack of a definition, if everything else in the shoreland zone that we have locally follows the state minimum guidelines, which it pretty much does. Than, than anybody, any reasonable person would assume that the definitions that go along with the mandation probably apply. And I think that would be the common and generally accepted definition for a basement. But the, if I could clarify something, the state law mandating shoreland zoning ordinances does not contain a definition for basement. Mr. Smith is referring to state law dealing with mandated building codes. And so again, we have... <coughs> no. well, I don't know, I'm looking at the main revised statutes. <laughs> Mandatory shoreline zoning definitions. Um, section 436A, and it defines basement. And it says, basement means any portion of a structure with a floor to ceiling height of six feet or more. That's right. And having more than 50% of its volume below the existing ground level. So I guess what I want to know, and what I'm asking both of you, because I clearly want to know what the right answer is, is whether we this definition is in fact sort of incorporated by default into our shoreland zoning ordinance because we haven't adopted any other definition of basement. That's, that's been my point. We have adopted a shoreland zoning ordinance that is comprehensive. And that ordinance is part of the zoning ordinance that tells us where to look for undefined terms. And that is at their customary and usual meaning, not to the state law or to the building code. Maybe town I think council it's. Could I think it's time to, uh, yeah, have town council either make a comment or decide to make one later. <coughs> um, hold your comment for a few moments. Um, I would agree with Mrs. Armstrong to the extent that there's there is a lot of case law which says an undefined term uh, used in your in an ordinance should be given its uh, customary uh, definition. Uh, basically, your common sense, go to the dictionary, what does it mean? She cites a case that I, I have 
not had an opportunity to take a look at. Um, and I'd like to read that case to see if uh, we would be prohibited from using what I had previously to tonight thought would be the definition of basement, which was agreeing with Mr. Smith's uh, definition in the Boca Code, which is more restrictive than the mandatory shoreland zoning, which, as Mr. Smith eloquently said, would be shoved down our throat if we didn't adopt a, our own shoreland zone. We did, uh, I don't know how many years ago, uh, adopt <coughs> the shoreline performance overlay zone. We submitted it to the state. It was approved. That's what we have. Um, we also have the Boca Code. But again, I'd like to review the case that is cited by, by the Armstrongs because I do know that as a general rule, an undefined term gets uh, the ordinary customary usage um, as a definition. So. If that case says we don't look at the Boca Code because it's not part of the zoning ordinance, uh, then I guess I would change my mind and we don't look at the Boca Code. I'm still concerned, however, that the state minimum, uh, state mandatory shoreland zoning, that definition may apply because that there certainly is a definition of basement in that uh, statute. So I, I don't have an answer for you tonight. I need to take a look at that, that case law. I'll, I'll clarify that at the beginning of this hearing, when we agreed to accept this additional written information, we were well aware that there may be um, some information here that would need to be looked over much more carefully than we can certainly do during this hearing. And I'm certainly getting the sense that uh, from our town council, as well as from the nature of the questions, that that's the direction we're going in. But because we are here in the middle of this hearing and this discussion. It's an opportunity to, to ask questions that will give us additional information. And I think that we're heading in the direction of tabling until the next meeting for this. May I ask if, if the uh, Armstrongs have that case uh, with them tonight? It's in the packet. It's in the packet that we, that so you could, you could probably look at that. I, I don't have a packet. Uh, <laughs> you have one. Um, do board members do board members ha hold your questions for a few moments? Do board members have uh, additional questions that they'd like to put forward here? At this time, I, I have more of a comment than, than a question. Is I, I view this case as being actually two arguments. Argument one is what is the normal high water line of coastal waters? If we define that, then there may or may not be an argument two, which we're a little bit bogged down in. That's a very good point. Who would like to address um, the point? Give you a moment. Okay. Give you a second. Uh, other board members like to make comments. I'd like to make point? a comment too. Um, I, the Armstrongs have presented an impressive amount of material, case law, to support their arguments. Um, and I think the Computo's attorney has already indicated that there was certain case law presented by the Armstrong that he's familiar with and he would interpret differently. And I think, out of fairness, but his attorney should be given the chance to give us a written interpretation or response uh, to help us come to a reasonable judgment about what really applies here. Because none of us here are expert on this. And uh, with the dilemma we have when we're presented with so much uh, very impressively organized and presented uh, material here is it's done in, for us on a very short term. It's done for the Caputos on a very short term. Um, and they should have the chance to provide some counter evidence to us, counter arguments to us. Are there other comments or discussion from the board? I would like to to give um, people in the in the audience a chance to add additional um, information, but I want to first keep it on the board for questions or comments so that we can see which direction we're going in. Mr. Prasad. I'd prefer to have you have the uh, public make their final comments, close it, so that we can get on with the uh, deliberation of this. That's uh, perfectly um, in order and a good idea. Um, we'll first uh, give the opportunity to the Caputos and then to the appellants. Uh, uh, please come to the microphone because this is being uh, taped and in fact televised for our residents. Uh, I'd like to introduce the Caputos architect again to do some calculations because you may not have to reach this basement question based on 
what, if, if the 16 foot, if Mr., if the termination of the high water line is, is correct, we can present evidence of calculations indicating that we're within 30 percent. Where that, so please. Hi, David Lloyd, architect. Um, I, I did do the calculations without the uh, lower level so-called accused basement, but if you, uh, if you, if you accept Mr. Smith's uh, definition of where the high water mark is, and you don't include that lower level, we're still only 21% uh, uh, expansion and well within the uh, square footage. So we're still not even close to maxing out what your, what your code uh, calls out for. Thank you. Any additional comments from the Caputo I, I, contingent? I just hope the, the impact of what he just said. Please, is, please speak into the microphone. Right, I just hope the impact of what he said gets across here. With we're all this arguing about basement, even if we completely exclude it, we are still only 21% in volume. This is a very modest expansion. It's not a large expansion. If we were to take it, we agree on the high water mark. We have, uh, we are only 21% of the 30% of volume. Even if we take this basement and do call it whatever you want to call it. Although everything we look at, I mean, you, you stand there and look outside, it's more than six foot high, it's seven foot two. I mean, I don't know how that can be called a basement. But again, he did the calculations that even if you did, it is still uh, doesn't, doesn't come up to 30% of the volume. So I, I don't know uh, uh, what else uh, we can say about that with, uh, with that final calculation. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Moody, any additional comments? Well, I'm pretty lost as well with all of these uh, situations presented, but I did read that the purpose of the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance was to protect visual access. So I'm just commenting to um, Mr. Smith's um, response to our concern about visual access. Thank you. And Ms. Is there Mr. Armstrong? Thank you. Just a couple points. Um, First, to respond to what the Caputo's attorney said about Trendy Point. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Trendy Point. I certainly went out there and examined it after I read the case to try to make some sense of it. And it is completely incorrect to say that on the southeasterly side of Trendy Point, that is the unprotected side where the line was 16 vertical feet above the line on the protected side, that it is a steep cliff. The geography of that point is very much like the geography in front of 31 Lawson Road. It is much more gradual than that. It's not a steep cliff. And so the code enforcement officer in that case, it is noted by the court, did have a difficult time. He had to do some work to figure out where the line was. It was not an obvious choice where the water was below and there was a steep cliff. So if there, if it's going to rest on that for the board, then I guess I would suggest that the board could take a view of Trendy Point um, if it needs to do that. Uh, the other point I have to make is I, I really appreciate the board listening to a lengthy argument and um, taking those documents, but I do think that in the future, um, as a suggestion, if the board is going to consider uh, and even taking a vote on precluding the admission of evidence because it's not presented in advance, that the board should uh, come up with some rules of procedure um, that would alert applicants that they're going to be precluded from introducing something if it is not provided in advance. Um, there should be a fair uh, playing field for both sides of, um, of this kind of dispute. Uh, and certainly we would be happy, would have been happy to follow any rules that the board had, but the board didn't have rules. And I'm sorry if that uh, inconvenienced the board. I thought I would present it in a manner that would be clear and easy to follow along. Uh, but just a suggestion for the future that, so that no one else will be in the same position that we're in. Thank you. If I may you. make a point on the Mac case, uh, I just reading through some of the highlights on it. One of the statements that was made in the Mac case or one of the conclusions was that the setback definition, meaning in the ordinance, implies at the top of the bank beach a cliff may be, depending on the particular site, 
the normal high water mark. However, it plainly contemplates other normal, normal high water marks. So, I, you know, I, we can use the Mac case, but without knowing where it was set and what was, what was on either side of that, it's, it's pretty hard to even understand what even got to what point with the Mac case. Even if you read the whole case, which I have, it still doesn't give a clear picture as to what was determined. Okay, thank you. I'm going to declare the hearing part of this meeting closed, and we will now have discussion on the board. I, I just feel I want to have more time to, to read everything carefully here, digest it, and um, perhaps develop some more questions myself. Um, I think I second that. Is there any other discussion? There hasn't been a motion to do so. Would you like to make a, such a motion and then we could have a second and some discussion uh, on bef that? Before a motion is made, uh, the comment has been made twice about two issues here. One is the uh, location of the high water line and the other is the definition of a basement. Um, I think sufficient evidence has been presented tonight to determine, make that determination as to where the high water line is. And uh, the comment earlier was that uh, it doesn't matter where the high water line is that the, uh, to determine the, the, uh, the second issue, that uh, uh, whether it's a basement or not a basement, uh, it still is less than the 30 percent of uh, uh, expansion. So I think we have enough information before us to determine where that high water line is. Well, hold, hold, hold the discussion for a moment. I'd like to entertain a motion and then debate debate that motion based on and incorporating some of your argument. Mr. Keneally, did you have a motion to make? I would, uh, I'm not sure if this is the proper motion, but um, I would like to move that we continue uh, this case until the board's meeting on the fourth Tuesday of February, if that's the next, if there is a fourth Tuesday in February. Um, the board's next meeting in any case. And uh, also, as part of that motion, invite um, the Caputos to submit to the board two weeks in advance of the next meeting anything they would like to submit in writing um, to comment on the arguments made by the Armstrongs. Is there a second to that motion? That's a second. Um, I think technically it needs to be a tabling until the next motion, isn't that correct? Would you consider that a, I would a friendly? Move, I, yes, I would move that we table this until the next meeting. And I don't know whether that is part of that motion. Can I also include the request that um, the Caputos be allowed to submit written commentary two weeks ahead of the next meeting? In uh, fact, any party can submit two. Before that motion is there's, the there's a motion and a second on the floor, and now we're, we're, we can discuss it, Mr. Well, Smith. You can't discuss the tabling. Though. Can you, Joe? Do we have a parliamentarian? Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, I think I've been corrected a couple of times. I don't believe you can discuss this, uh, the, uh, the tabling issue. All right, then. We now have a motion to table on the floor with a second. I'll call the question. I have one quick question. Um, it's not so much procedural, you but if I... You can't discuss the tabling motion. You can uh, withdraw or ask to withdraw or not vote it down to discuss, but you can't once you table, that's it. In that case, I'm sorry I rushed it to a motion stage. I thought it would facilitate the discussion. <laughs> uh, uh, a motion to table... Uh, is appropriate at any time. I'm not, I don't remember my Roberts Rules of Order well enough to say that it, it's not subject to discussion. I thought that it was subject to discussion. It uh, cut me off. <laughs> remember that, Joe? Joe, Joe cut you off? Yeah. <laughs> He's like that. <laughs> I'd like to suggest to the staff that we have a Roberts Rules here for the future such things, and we'll, we'll check on this for the next one. I, I mean, Robert, Roberts Rules are a guideline anyway. So even if Robert Hull said it's not appropriate, uh, the board could still discuss reasons why you'd want to table it. So. In, in that case, I'll entertain um, discussion on, 
on tabling or not tabling. And you well, the question I had is, we're, we're um, allowing for the Caputas to enter in further evidence. Are we opening that up to um, the appellants as well to yeah, bolster their case? I, I tried to refine the motion at the end there that it's open to anyone who wants to submit written it, material two weeks in advance. Of next meeting. Yeah, perhaps the best best way to have the motion worded is that any inf written information must be in two weeks before the next board meeting, which is on February 22nd. Two weeks today. prior to the, today. Yeah. Pardon to the me? next, two weeks prior to the meeting. Two weeks meeting, prior to because the Because that's the only meeting. way you're going to get it in your packets. So that's, that's what you choose to do. One week from today would be the deadline then. Is there other discussion on the issue of tabling? Well, since you are <laughs> entertaining discussion, I see that the building permit was issued uh, December 13th. Uh, in the last century, um, the applicant uh, of the permit, um, I'm assuming, is waiting to start construction. He got snowed out uh, last week, uh, putting this off to, uh, for uh, putting off a decision for another another month, it might be a financial burden on him. And uh, I'd like to see us move forward on this this evening, so at least he can make some plans. Is there further discussion? I just think that not having the benefit of reading the cases that we were given tonight, I don't think I'm prepared to make that decision and interpretation of cases as both parties have clearly referred to tonight. When, when is the next meeting? February 22nd, um, weather permitting. So that would be three weeks from today. It's always scheduled for the fourth Tuesday of the month, which that so is the, in this month. So any paperwork would have to be in by next Tuesday. That's right. One week. I will say that I will not be here for the next meeting. I will not be here for the next meeting either, which is another reason why I wanted to take action tonight. What was your suggestion to, to have it next week? I do not make a suggestion. I oh. continue on tonight. Oh. But you have a motion on the floor. Well, I, I think that um, Mr. Hill has already said that he would like to get back and review the case law in terms of uh, where the basement definition actually comes from in a case like this. Um, right, but the, but if it's depending on uh, where the board determines the. Um, Normal high water mark. That that basement issue may be moot. Um, if well, it, but it isn't moot. It's part of the building permit application. This board has to answer that one way or another. Otherwise, okay. he's going to have to resubmit a building permit application. That that, that issue has to be resolved. It, um, it would be resolved in the sense that even if we didn't include it in a determination, it would still meet the thirty percent. I, I, I agree with you. It, it, it is something that needs, the issue does need to be resolved, but it may be such that um, uh, even if we include it, it's not going it, to, it'll still meet the 30%. Well, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I, I just, the board can't make one determination and leave that hanging because, because the building permit was based on that. So there that has to, still has to be a conclusion at some point, right. I believe. But, but what the board would be reviewing is whether you improperly issued a building permit and uh, um, they can make the determination that even if, even if we didn't include it uh, in the calculation, your building permit should not be revoked depending on where the high water line is. So I know what, I know what you're saying. Um, and it would be nice to have a final determination as to that issue because it may be important in the future because the expansion is limited 30% uh, the lifetime of the structure. What are we going to go by here? So um, th I think the board uh, also has the option, as, as Mr. Smith mentioned, uh, that you could call a uh, special meeting if, if certain board members know they're not going to be here at the next regularly scheduled meeting. And it, um, if we need to, if we wanted to uh, 
move that meeting up a week or something like that. We, we knew people were going to be here. I'm very sensitive to the Caputo's, as Mr. Christashi said, uh, Caputo's desire to have some resolution to this, know whether they put a horse back and the, the Armstrongs, I'm sure, want a resolution of it too. The board could call a special meeting if they wanted to. <laughs> I'm thinking that it, there, there may be some value to us having some discussion about the issue about the high water mark um, before we take a vote on that. And I think we can do it in two ways. One is that the motion could be withdrawn or it could be voted down and then we could decide whether we wanted to reintroduce it. I don't know which is the most proper way to do it. I think we legally can do it either way. You, want, you ask. You're asking me if I'm interested in withdrawing the motion at the table. Um, I will withdraw the motion for tabling um, for the purpose of perhaps setting up a, a special meeting. I, I still make a statement that for my own sake, even on the question of what's the right definition of the high water line, I'm not prepared to make that decision tonight. I want I want the ability to digest this material uh, much more completely than I can uh, sitting here tonight. Okay, let's. Um, so so you, I will you, draw, you I will withdraw the. Uh, and the second will agree. Okay, let's let's have a discussion. I would like to hear discussion from the board on the evidence that we've heard presented about the definition of the high water line and the evidence that's been presented for the various high water lines what we know and what we don't know. In terms of a definition for the normal high water line, it, I guess, is it agreed or is it the understanding that we should be using the one that's found in the zoning ordinance manual? Or is it open to interpretation as? Well, definition stands. That's, but, but what you got to determine, whether the determination specifically and generally but the issue is, is it the seawall or is it where the water line is during a normal tide? Is that or somewhere else? It's up for grabs, I guess, at this point. I think that we are, we're obligated to follow the definition in the ordinance. And it's our obligation to interpret the facts that have been presented to us. Uh, page 12 of the ordinance. Um, and it's our job to apply the facts to the definition and interpret and make a factual determination as to where the normal high water line is. <clears throat> as I read the definition, it refers to the line on the shore of tidal waters, which is the apparent extreme limit of the effect of the tides. There are a couple things that I focus on there. One is apparent, and one is effect of the tides. So I don't read this definition as being the absolute high water mark where, at some point in recent past, um, during the course of the last 20 years or 30 years, water has come up over the seawall and into the basement. Um, I don't think, from what we've heard, that those incidents... 30 years of experience of living on the road, but rather something that an ordinary person should be able to determine um, based on tidal movement alone. The IE that's added to the end of the definition, I think, is very confusing. I think the case that we have that was presented to us by Ms. Armstrong, um, is the Mac case, is helpful in explaining that. Um, and I don't read that to say that the top of the bank is the extreme limit of the effects of the tides. And I don't read that to say that the seawall by default becomes the limit of the effect of the tides. Um, 
I don't think the placement of seawall in and of itself necessarily defines the effect of the tides. The seawall simply defines the point at which the builder decided to put the seawall, uh, which may have little or nothing to do with the actual um, effect of the high tide. So that all having been said, um, I don't accept the seawall as a matter of law as being the high tide line. Um, I don't accept that any more than we should accept the house itself as being the high tide line, since we know that water has in fact come up to the house itself and has gone into the basement. It seems to me that based on what we've heard, the normal high water line is somewhere on the seaward side of the seawall. <clears throat> Beyond that, I'm not quite sure where to draw the line. But that's the way I read the ordinance. I uh, agree with uh, what Mr. Backer has said, and it may be useful for the board to, um, if you haven't gone out and taken a look at the property, to go out and take a, take a look at it, have a site walk and take a look at it. Because this is a type of case where uh, it would be very helpful for the board in making the determination rather than looking at the pictures, although these, you know, they're, they're helpful, but it may be something that the board wishes to uh, take a look at on their own. I would also point out, there, there are a couple things on the Mac case, if, 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 uh, if you read that case, it, it talks about testimony of, uh, in a 100-year storm, the water coming completely over Trundy Point. That discussion was not relevant to the normal high water line. It was relevant to uh, a safety issue, which was one of the criteria in that application. Um, and it wasn't, it didn't address the normal high water line. So I don't want there to be confusion about uh, a storm surge uh, breaching the seawall. And then that means that the normal high water line has to be uh, inland from the seawall, because that's, that's not what the Mac case is talking about. Um, so I, I concur with what Mr. Backer said. And one of the points in the Mac case is uh, the building inspector located the line on the southeasterly side of Trundy Point as a line of vegetation beyond which the topography is characterized by jagged ledge and small pools. And from my understanding of what Mr. Smith has uh, said and what the other evidence was, that is what he used to make his determination was a, a line of vegetation. And it doesn't, our ordinance doesn't um, speak to that, but it is uh, what is uh, visible to a person who's walking out there. The case, uh, the Matt case, the code enforcement officer in the Mac case made that call looking at the line of vegetation and, uh, and that was held to be a, a reasonable interpretation of this same um, definition of normal high water line. I think, it, I think it would have been very easy for Mr. Smith to say it's, a, it's the seawall and that would have been kind of a lazy, I think, a lazy determination because the ordinance doesn't say anything about a seawall. It talks about the effect of, of the tides. So um, uh, I, I don't, if Mr. Smith was looking for the easy way out, he could have just uh, picked the seawall. But I, I think he, he spent uh, uh, time and um, really thought about it and, and had visited the site uh, on more than one occasion. And this, the board may wish, the members may wish to uh, visit it as well if they haven't already. Mr. Hill, did I ask you a question? Uh, uh, relative to Mr. Backer's conjecture about the interpretation of extreme limit of the effect of the tides, um, Mr. Backer conjectures um, that that's independent of any storm yes. effects. Is that a normal interpretation? That, that's what I was trying to get at in, in the... I mean, aside from 100-year storms, it's just yes. normal storms? It, it, Yes, I mean, the first word, it, it's normal high water line of coastal waters, and it is the apparent extreme limit of the effect of the tides, and I think that that would be the tides absent. Uh, absent any storms. Uh, 100, yeah, the, 
unusual storms which mm. which may breach mm. it, it would be in normal conditions going out there looking at it where is it apparent that the effect of the tide the extreme effect of the tide it no question it's the extreme effect and it it, it isn't the uh, state definition of where the uh, mean high water line is it, it is farther inland than that under our ordinance uh, a couple points uh, i did have the town planner uh, out there with me who has a 13-year history with the town who who agreed uh, with my interpretation uh, on site i also failed to mention for the record the the photos taken on the 25th after the astronomical high tide of 11.6 feet which is a foot and a half above the NGVD normal, uh, which clearly shows um, anywhere from 8 to, to 14 feet of snow line beyond where I determined the normal high water line was on an astronomical high tide. That, to me, has a lot of bearing in enforcement of where I called that line originally. Bruce, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what the, the yellow line was. On the, yellow, the yellow line is, your, is, is, is the normal high water line. It was determined by me from prior visits. Ms. Smith, why was there a difference between what the surveyor gave as the high water line and your high water line? Could the you normal explain? high water line of the surveyor plotted was based on the state minimum guidelines, which talks about a normal high water line based on NGVD, which is National Geodetic Vertical Datum, which is an established benchmark from 1929 that, 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 that everybody references um, for elevations. Okay. Uh, so if, like I said before, if we were going under the state guidelines, that normal high water line would be somewhere between 14 and 30 feet seaward of, of my call. Very much less strict, restrictive than, than, than our conservative ordinance. This is most interesting. I, I, I mean, I've I, I got to say that I've, I've had four years of oceanfront, and it's completely unique in comparison to lakefront. Lakefront is is a, somewhat more obvious um, because there's a certain shore vegetation. It's, 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 it's an easier call. I found it quite interesting to, to try to determine uh, in certain cases, especially where the rocks are, but I've always tried to use a common sense approach um, based on the fact that, that the history of the town uh, has done the same thing. Um, and coupled with that, I, I, I think it, it's, it's something that um, meets the intent of the audience. Is there further discussion on the board? Actually, uh, could you make a special meeting a few weeks from now? What is the date, two weeks? 15th. Oh, the 15th. Uh, I'll be in town, 15th, yes. Can we talk about that as a possibility?
one of the pieces of discussion is should we try to schedule a special meeting where all members that are in attendance today or the majority would be able to attend. There are two conflicts on the 22nd and we're discussing the February 15th uh, date as an alternative for a, as another date for a special meeting for just this item of business. Are all members available to meet on that date? Should we decide to move forward with that? There's been no motion to that effect yet, but we're discussing it. Is that a yes? Uh, you're talking about the 15th? The 15th. Is uh, that planning board? I think it's planning board night. It does not appear to be an option then. Are, we're required to have the meetings in this room. Uh, Next Tuesday is town council, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it doesn't have to be on a Tuesday night, yeah, but I, I just I had mentioned to Mr. Smith that I thought that the plan board meeting was that that night, so we want to be careful if we're scheduling a special meeting that doesn't uh, interfere with uh, town council or planning board, but. Let me let me just ask the board: Is it um, is it the um, cl consensus or close to consensus that people would like time to consider the information uh, further beyond this evening? No. How about others? Leslie's going to go check this the, uh, the meeting schedule, uh, so she'll have an idea. Okay. Um, I'm doing a straw poll of those who would like additional time to consider things that would <coughs> feel comfortable voting this evening. Yeah, I, I would like additional time. How about you? Depends what the issue is that we get to. Um, I think based on the evidence that we have in front of us tonight, um, I would be prepared to vote on where the high water mark is. I'm in agreement with that as well. I th for, uh, for one party, it represents bad news, but I think we are we're bound to to make a decision so that we can get going. And um, the, the, we've got visual document visual evidence that gives us a pretty clear indication of what the high water mark is. Let's get some legal clarification from town council on if the board is is ready to make a vote on the high water line issue. For the other issues that remain, um, do we need to additional time to come to resolution on those to resolve them enough for action on these appeals, or are we able to take action on each item? With the information that we have, <clears throat> um, as to the term, determination of the normal high water line, that that's really a factual determination for the board. If if you felt uh, that there was enough information for you here tonight to decide uh, on that issue, then we could move on to whether it's necessary to address. Uh, the, the basement issue and calculation of 30 percent uh, expansion. Uh, I'm comfortable with uh, advising the board on the last issue uh, that was raised in the appeal uh, as to whether we are prohibited or the town is prohibited from allowing any expansion uh, whatsoever um, under the Lewis versus uh, Rockport case. Um, and I'd be happy to address that issue if, if, if you'd like. Um, I think you've raised it. I think that would be helpful then. The, the Lewis case, um, as um, the attorney for the Caputo said, um, had to do with a side setback and an existing point of the building which was uh, in violation of the side setback. And, that they, and the applicant wanted to 
uh, go no further or no closer to the sideline than the existing closest point. But it was going to change the footprint of, of the structure and more of the building was going to be non-conforming. And uh, I think in the town of Cape Elizabeth, if somebody wanted to do that, they'd get turned down uh, because that that is a, a clear um, expansion. expansion right that would be prohibited. If our ordinance ended uh, with that sentence that it can be expanded so long as it doesn't increase the non-conforming of the structure, period, and no further discussion about the 30% 30 ex 30 expansion of the floor area or volume, or the further clarification that no expansion can go closer to the water, then I would agree with the Armstrongs that there is, under this um, proposal, there's going to be an increase in the square footage of this structure, which is going to be non-conforming. And if our ordinance simply ended with that other sentence, I don't think that there could be um, an expansion um, that's being proposed. Our ordinance doesn't end there. It goes on to uh, describe um, that there are limits to expansions. We will allow 30% uh, expansion of floor area or volume. Uh, and it, it talks about not, uh, the footprint not going closer to the water. Um, yeah, that's an inconsistency between that the first sentence that says you cannot as long you can have an expansion as long as it doesn't increase the nonconformity, and then the, the next paragraph talking about a 30 percent expansion of that portion which uh, uh, is within the 75 feet but if we if we read it the way the Armstrongs are arguing then um, that next paragraph has no meaning and one of the basic rules of statutory construction is for uh, the board to try to give meanings to all parts of the ordinance. Um, and, and therefore, I'd say that our ordinance allows expansions, limited expansions, non-conforming structures, which don't meet that 75-foot setback. Um, there is a provision in the ordinance which says if there are inconsistencies between provisions of the ordinance, the more restrictive provision applies. My reading of that has always been uh, not inconsistencies within the same provision, which this is. We're talking about the same, uh, same heading, expansion of nonconforming structures in the shoreland zone, but rather if um, for example, in an RA district, if a setback were uh, 25 feet, but in a shoreland performance overlay zone, it, were, it was uh, 10 feet, then you'd go with the more restrictive provision and, and it'd be a 10 foot setback, as an example. So uh, again, a basic rule of statutory construction is for us to uh, determine what the intent of the town council was of the leg town's legislative body in adopting this ordinance and to attempt to give meaning to each provision in the ordinance. And under the Armstrong's um, argument, we don't give any meaning to the next two paragraphs. And that, I think, violates a, a pretty basic rule of statutory uh, construction. So I, my, my opinion is we, uh, the town's ordinance does allow uh, certain expansions, not conforming structures, within the 75-foot setback, uh, but it is limited. It's limited to the 30 percent. Okay. Thank you. We can now move in any direction we like. Madam Chairperson, I'd like to make a motion that we accept Mr. Smith's determination of the normal high water line for coastal waters. Second. 
Is there a second for that? I'll second that. Okay, and is there discussion on that? Either for or against. I think that uh, what Mr. Smith has presented to us um, in his determination of the normal high water line is reasonable. I think it is supported by um, substantial evidence that he has presented uh, in support of his finding. And the only other reasonable evidence that I believe has been presented to us of a differing high water line is actually more toward the sea rather than away from the sea. Um, and I think that to accept uh, Mr. Smith's determination of the high water line is actually uh, a more favorable determination um, to the um, appellants um, than it would have been to accept the Caputo's original um, establishment of the high water mark. And to go beyond Mr. Smith's high water mark determination uh, seems to be a leap of interpretation of the ordinance that, that is not in fact supported by any evidence that's been presented to us. So um, I think for that reason, uh, what Mr. Smith has established um, is factually supportable and reasonable. Other <clears throat> comments, discussion before we vote? Different interpretations? No, I, I agree with what has been said so far. I'm just, I'm kind of wondering what direction we're going in the sense that if we're going to put this together as a package and vote on everything tonight, I think this vote makes sense. If our, if some of the other board members are leaning toward evaluating the evidence to make the decision about the 30% basement um, and the different issues that we also have to consider, and we're going to be here another night, I say we should defer this and put it together in one one night's vote instead of segmenting it um, and trying to get a parcel it out and do part of it tonight. If we're going to be back here to consider the evidence um, more completely, let's be back here to vote more completely. However, we've, we've heard from the town council that if we accept this high water line um, with his interpretation of, of the ordinances, then we would not accept the other issues that are under appeal and what would next happen would be a, a motion regarding all the points of the appeal which we'd deal with one by one and we would deal with it tonight. So if, if I'm making the interpretation that if we, if we accept Mr. Smith's high water line by a vote then we would be prepared to move forward and consider all the others and deal with it as a, as a package. Is there anyone that would disagree? I, no, I think it has to be a package. I, mean, I, I, I want to make one comment. Um, those of you who've been on this board with me for the past, you know, I don't like to drag my feet. I, don't, I like to be fairly decisive. But I think that in Cape Elizabeth, protection of the shorelands is one of the most important characteristics of the town and one of the most important responsibilities we have as, as town officials. And um, I, I just think there's been an awful lot of information presented tonight uh, which um, represents conflicting points of view. And I think it's a very, very important question for the town that's before us tonight. I suspect there's a good chance that no matter what we do, it'll go to court after us. And I think that our decision finally rendered should be rendered with sufficient fact-finding and sufficient thought that it's a useful uh, piece of data for whatever court case might come after this. If you believe that strongly, then a motion to table 
would be in order now before we take the other vote. And if there is a second, then we'll vote it up or down. Okay, I will. I believe that I'm um, procedurally correct there. I will move that we table this until the next day of the special or regularly scheduled meeting of the zoning board. Is there a second to that motion? I second that motion. Then we will vote now on whether we will table this until a meeting to be scheduled after the vote. Either a special meeting or our next regular meeting. All those in favor of tabling. It's two. All opposed? Three. So the um, the original motion is on the table now, which is a motion to accept Mr. Smith's high water line. It's been a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion before we vote? All right, then. All in favor? Raise your hands and signify by saying aye. Aye. It's three. All opposed? Two. Motion carries. Let the record show that the chair did not vote on this. I mean, are you abstaining? I think I was caught up in the process. <laughs> okay. Um, I will abstain for, for this. Okay. Are you going to take care of any other issues tonight? We've now accepted Mr. Smith's high water line. I voted three to two. Don't we need uh, four votes to pass that motion? No, only on a variance do you need to have. Okay. The, you just need a simple majority on an administrative appeal. You do need four votes for a variance, okay. but um, on an administrative appeal, simple majority. So really where you are now is uh, determining uh, whether the, um, uh, it may make sense to take the uh, last argument um, next, whether uh, the board feels that the, under the town's ordinance, um, there can be any uh, expansion of the nonconformity or the, that portion of the structure which is non-conforming. Um, and I've already spoken to that issue, but I, I think it makes sense to address that now. If you, you're free to uh, decide how you, you wish. You don't have to follow my uh, advice on it. Obviously, I'm just advising you what I, what I think. But uh, if, if you disagreed with me, the matter would be moot and you, you would uh, deny the uh, application if you uh, follow my advice, then we would move on to whether uh, we need to address anything further on the basement issue and, the, and the, how that may calculate into the 30 percent expansion. Well, I believe if you go down through the appellant's grievances on the notice that, that number two follows number one. Mm -hmm. It says, Mr. Smith incorrectly determined that only part of the main structure was in the 75-foot set, shoreline setback. You, you determine that, that the, where the normal high water line is. so. It would seem reasonable that two would follow one. So I think you, you could take care of two. Yeah. There are issues. If you look at the Armstrong list of grievances, those two, one and two, are linked. Um, three deals with basement and volume, and four deals with says that there would be an increase in the footprint as well as the floor area and volume. We haven't heard testimony on the footprint issue yet. Well, I, I think you did hear testimony that it did not. Uh, you, I think the submissions by the Armstrongs said that it did increase the footprint. And you had uh, testimony from the Caputos and the Caputos architect that it didn't uh, change the footprint. If you wanted to take That's correct. additional, uh, if you had questions on that issue, 
certainly can ask uh, people like for this clarification on that. So you're suggesting that it would be most helpful to Actually, when uh, Bruce said the, that point two uh, about the, the portion of the structure being uh, within the 75 foot, I'm not sure how it's worded. I, w I was looking at those two issues as being really determined uh, determined by whether the board uh, accepted Mr. Smith's determination of the high water line. I think that kind of takes care of both both issues, but. Right. Yeah, because under the Armstrong's um, <coughs> argument, if, if you had followed where they believe the normal high water was, then the entire structure was within the 75 uh, foot rather than uh, only a portion of it, which is consistent with um, Mr. Smith's determination, which the board has already uh, adopted or agreed was reasonable. Would you like to further clarify? <laughs> Go ahead, Bruce. That's fine. Well, we were just discussing the five points, and um, it would seem to me that one, two, four, and five could be clarified and, and taken care of tonight, with three possibly being the exception. Is it um, acceptable form to deal with some of the points, but not all? No, I, I think you'd want to uh, deal with all of them. Uh, if you got to a point where you felt like you couldn't make a determination on one of the issues, then, you know, again, a motion to table may be appropriate. But I, I think that what, what Bruce and I have been saying is that once you make the determination as to where the normal high water line is, it, it, it really it takes care of some of those other issues, and you may wish to just address those right now. Um, you could address, and then if you could get hung up on one, you could table that one or two or whatever it may be. That was my procedural question to you, right. Mr. Hill. Yeah, you'd be table. You could table a final determination of whether uh, to. Uh, um, uh, support uh, Mr. Smith's granting of the building permit or to deny it. I think you can you can go through as much as you can, and then if you get to a point where you feel you need more time on a particular issue, then you could table <coughs> the matter at that point and come back to it at a, at a later time to resolve that issue. Does that make it any clearer? Well, are all the other points moved after the if, if the board has asserted that Mr. Smith correctly identified the normal high water line, then are all the other points moot in any case? Well, some of uh, Number two, uh, Mr. Smith incorrectly determined the only part, that only part of the main structure is within the 75 foot shoreline setback. Again, by already uh, determining where the normal high water line is, uh, you've, you've resolved that issue as well. Um, three needs to be addressed. Um, well, it, may, it may be moot in the, in the, in the sense that uh, even if the lowest floor, which uh, um, were uh, improperly included in the calculation, even if we take that uh, out, it's still within the 30%. So I think, 
I think that's, that could be mooted. Uh, I, I'd recommend that you make motion, you know, you make findings on all of these issues, though. But um, four, expansion would increase footprint, floor volume, height <coughs> within the 75 footprint. Uh, foot setback, thereby increasing the nonconformity of the structure in violation of the ordinance and state law. That goes to the issue that I talked about earlier. Uh, the, um, if you are going to give meaning to the paragraph that talks about a 30% expansion of floor area or volume uh, or not, and then five uh, permit would allow an expansion in volume of more than 30% in violation of the ordinance and state law. That really relates back to whether the um, basement area was properly included, which, as I said, I think is mooted by where you have determined the high water line to be. So I, I would just, I'd recommend just going down through each one of these um, uh, grievances and <coughs> I think that a lot of it is already uh, would just naturally follow from your factual determination as to where the normal high water line is. Would we like to take them one by one, or as a one by one? All right, then I'll entertain a motion. And I think we'll start out with the Armstrong grievance. Would you like to make a motion? Um, I move that the board determined that Mr. Smith correctly determined that only a portion of the main structure is within the 75 foot, foot shoreline setback. Is there a second? Second. Jack. Any discussion? Being none, all in favor? Aye. Um, are there additional motions? We're we are now voting to deny the appeal. Is that is that what we're doing, Dave? Was that the intent of your your motion? In doing so, aren't we denying the appeal? We're denying the the, the grievance, but in doing so, we're denying the appeal. That's ultimately where I expect okay. the votes to go okay. at this point, but I was taking them one okay. point of the appeal at a time. Well, I won't interrupt then. Continue on. Mm. What, what we're doing is going through um, point by point to make sure we're in agreement with them, and then we'll have a motion to regarding the whole grievance. Do you have an additional motion? You're doing well so far. Um, I think objection number three is the hardest one to address. Um, and I'm looking to Mr. Hill, um, wondering whether um, it's appropriate to make a motion that whether, that the board determine that whether the lower level of the Caputo's home is a basement or not, um, is irrelevant for purposes of being determinative of any funding we might make tonight because even if it um, <coughs> is excluded uh, from the computation of the relevant floor area, the overall expansion is still less than 30 percent and less, th less than a 30 percent increase in total volume. So I'm suggesting that we not make a finding one way or another as to whether or not the lower level does, in fact, right. fall within the definition of a basement. And I don't, I don't think you have to make that determination because uh, it is mooted by where you've determined the high water mark, normal high water line to be. So you don't, you can resolve the appeal without making a specific finding as to whether it's a, whether basement, um, whether that. The definition of basement includes that lower level or not. Right. Then so. I, I move that the board make a determination 
that whether the lower level of the Caputo's home is determined to be a basement or not, uh, the expansion is still less than an increase of 30% in total volume and is therefore within the permissible limits of the ordinance. Is there a second? And therefore does not affect the building permit, correct? And therefore does not affect the building permit application? Well, the building permit has already been issued. Oh, it does not affect the building permit. I still second. Okay. Is there discussion on that motion on the floor? All in favor? All opposed? Five. Okay. Do you have additional motions? Through all this discussion this evening, the height has not, not been an issue. Is that still the case, that the height of this building is not an issue? That was a concern I had when I reviewed the packet, but it looked like it was about 33 feet when I scaled it out. That Could isn't you tell part me? Of, it isn't part of the grievance. It's 31 feet. I know it's not part of the grievance. I had a concern that it that it uh, might have been higher than 35 feet. And no, I just wanted to clarify. the average original grade to the, to the mean level of the highest rule. Okay, I just wanted that clarified. And then is there a motion regarding that issue? I'll make a motion that the expansion will not increase the footprint, floor area, volume, or height within the 75 foot setback, therefore, um, not increasing the uh, nonconformity of the structure in violation of the ordinance and state law. But it, it does increase the floor area and volume, but it's not. But it's suspension would not. You've got to determine whether it's okay, in violation of the ordinance. It would increase. Okay, I'll correct that motion. Uh, the expansion would increase the footprint, floor area, volume, and height within the 75 foot setback, but would not increase the nonconformity of the structure in violation of the ordinance and state law. I'm doing this without my glasses. You've, you've read it accurately and. Thank, thank you. <laughs> and my, my only comment on that, I, I know how it's worded in, in, the, uh, in the findings, but I just want to call your attention to whether you, you mean to say that the footprint is being enlarged or not. I mean, I That's right. It wouldn't increase the footprint, but it does increase the floor area volume and height. There's still a motion on the floor which has not been seconded, and so if you want to fine-tune the wording so that you can make it reflect what we're actually talking about from the plans. Um, Mr. Smith, I believe you just said that it would increase the footprint. I mean, it would not increase the footprint, but would increase the floor area volume and height within the 75-foot setback but would not increase the nonconformity. Is that accurate? Of the, in violation of the ordinance yeah. of state law, correct. Completing the sentence. I'll go along with what you said. <laughs> uh, there's motion on the floor. Is there a second? Oh, go ahead. I second. Okay, and is there further discussion? Are you satisfied that we have the wording exactly right? Okay. Then uh, this motion on the floor, all in favor? All opposed? Okay, five. <coughs> Is there an additional motion or more? We've dealt with four of the five points so far. So the, like the fifth motion? one on the um, list talks about that the permit would allow an expansion of volume of more than 30 percent in violation of the ordinance and state law. And, and um, based upon what you've already uh, talked about earlier, if the motion for, the, for this finding were that it is uh, that the expansion uh, does not increase the floor area or volume by more than 30 percent, I think would 
be my sense of where you're going with that, but mm -hmm. that's just as a suggestion. Yeah. Would someone like to make a motion that incorporates that? I move that the expansion um, in volume of less than 30 percent um, is in compliance with the ordinance and state law. Is in compliance? Did you is, is in compliance with the local ordinance and with state law. Is there a second? Discussion. All in favor? All opposed? Abstentions? It's an abstention? Okay. Keneally extension? Abstention? Okay. We've now dealt with the um, five points of the grievance from the Armstrongs. The next step would um, uh, be I to mean, get some advice from town council. Well, I think you would, you would uh, move, uh, based on what you've decided uh, already, I think you would uh, have to conclude that you would uh, deny the appeal. So I think a motion to deny the appeal uh, would be appropriate. And, um, and then I think you need to uh, make the same motion on the uh, Moody appeal as well, mm -hmm. based on what you've already decided. And would we need to, we wouldn't need to do um, point by point, we could just... No. <laughs> um, is, is there a motion that someone would like to bring forward? I move that the administrative appeal of Anthony and Julie Armstrong um, appealing from the decision of the code enforcement officer Bruce Smith granting a building permit on December 13, 1999 to Daniel and Diane Caputo for their property at 31 Lawson Road be denied. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. All in favor of the motion. We have uh, four in favor, all opposed? One. All right. We've dealt with the Armstrong appeal. We now have before us the Moody appeal. Is there a motion that someone would like to bring forward about it? I move that the administrative appeal of Kimberly Moody, um, appealing from the decision of Code Enforcement Officer Bruce Smith, granting a building permit on December 13, 1999, to Daniel and Diane Caputo for their property at 31 Lawson Road, be denied. Okay, the motion's been uh, offered and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? It's four to one. Okay. We've now addressed the two appeals. Is there any other business before this board this evening? Communications. Communications. We're moving on to next item of business, which is communications, letter E. Uh, I only have one thing. Um, at the next regularly scheduled meeting, um, would it be prudent for the board to meet uh, a half an hour before to to indoctrinate the new members as to uh, what how things work and have Mr. Hill present to present a little something? I would um, only suggest that half an hour is probably too short at times. Well, we can have longer if you think. Um, in the past, we've done a, a half an hour, but really, it's always tight. No, we've had an hour before. I think our time well, not before the meeting. We've had workshops totally dedicated. Yeah, no, we've had an hour before the meeting. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Pizza, had pizza brought in and uh, went around with Mike. Not, never pizza before me, but it's okay. It's nice. We're still, we're still in formal meeting. I'd like to thank, thank all the um, members who, of the community who helped us in these deliberations. Um, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith is, uh, has proposed that we meet um, 
um, before the next meeting. Our next regularly scheduled meeting is February 22nd. And um, generally when we have new board members, we like to um, give them a briefing of the legal overview. And we're looking at the option of having it at 6, starting at 6 p.m. Can we do it with a pizza? Sure, soda? sure. Um, overview of, some money for that. of legal issues related to the um, special nature of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Mm. I think that'd be a real good idea. It, it'll be most instructive for um, everyone that's already been on the board as well to continue to review our, our creed. Um, we yeah, do need to check with like um, Mr. Hill's um, schedule to see if you are <coughs> available to be the main entertainment. For Pizza party at 6 on the 22nd. And whenever there's food, I can rearrange my schedule and be here. Miller and... <laughs> Madam Chair. Yeah. Yes. Could you at that workshop session, if you want to call it that, also discuss um, a deadline on receiving any material for anything that comes before this board? Again, I'll, I'll reiterate, it was my impression that we've already discussed this in previous workshop sessions and that we, we did say that we would not receive anything after the Wednesday uh, prior to the meeting so that Bruce could collect it, get it to us so that we could read it. Um, I think it's very, very important that we have anything on any case that we, receive, that we review to have stuff before us so that we're not bombarded with uh, legal issues, cases presented to us, uh, or any other information. Uh, it uh, distorts our judgment, confuses us after we have spent a weekend reviewing information and feeling comfortable. I felt comfortable coming into this meeting tonight that Bruce had done his homework, um, that the Caputos basically had brought uh, a surveyor out there and established the line. <coughs> Um, but then to have other information brought before us, I think I thought it only complicated the matter and dragged it out a lot longer. But yeah, I, I certainly would like to, to, uh, to, to have a, an established I'd, I'd like to have some, uh, you know, I mean, I'd like to have a clarification from, from you <coughs> like, on, on whether we can require somebody to submit. Yes, you can. Um, the for board, an administrative appeal. The, the board can adopt. Uh, reasonable procedural rules, which could include um, uh, a, a deadline by which material had to be has to be submitted. So the board could do that. And I think it's I think it's a good suggestion. I, I don't I don't know the motives of the uh, of the Armstrongs. I I, I I don't think that it was to uh, confuse you or bombard you. Um, and there there isn't an existing rule. So I, you know I don't want to I didn't want to penalize them from presenting what they had obviously spent an awful lot of time, and it was a very good presentation, and, and I think it would have been made uh, more helpful to you if you'd gotten it earlier. So I think adopting that rule, um, uh, which would be similar to the planning board rules uh, on submission deadlines, uh, would be well, very I strongly. I did strongly suggest to the appellants that, that the board needed to stop in time enough to review Sure. She chose not to submit. I had no control at that point. I, well, no, I will I later. But the board can always make the stand that they're only going to review what's in the packet. I, that's what I'm hearing from you if they make this rule. How, yes, however, it, it, would make it, it would make it much clearer if we... I mean, yeah, I think it would have to be in writing and uh, made available to uh, applicants and appellants so that they know what they're dealing with and not... Uh, uh, but I would not like to be... Ex I don't want to get in a position where we exclude something that is pertinent that comes up between within that two weeks, such as the document I submitted today, which was was put in because of the astronomical high tide, and I thought it was a real pertinent piece of evidence. Well, Bruce, a lot of this information was done well in advance, and we the pictures, things like that. Certainly the law cases, that was prepared well in advance. We could have had that information before us. If there was one piece of evidence that was delayed because people were busy, weather or whatever else, that's understandable too. But to most of these people that come before us, time is of the essence. They have a, a, a timetable that they must follow. And I think as a board, 
we should, we should uh, review the information and make a decision as quickly as we can so we don't penalize one party or the other. And that's why I say the information should be before us so we can consider it and, give it, and rule on it in a timely manner. Right. And that's the only reason why I've been upset. And I've been on the board for, what, five years now? And I can see the advantage of getting the stuff before us well in advance. And not to say that that was the Armstrong's intent to, to hold us up, but no. it, it could be used by, by an appellant uh, to hold up a case if they chose to do it, if we don't, if we don't require that the submissions become it, it would certainly put us in good position to have this policy on the books. We can always right. make the decision to accept an exception, um, but right. without, a, without a policy that's written, that's publicly on the documents that they're given when they're filing such an appeal, doesn't give us any recourse except, to be fair, we have to accept it all, and this would prevent us having to do that. Could, could I request that staff draft something um, for, for as, a, as a draft uh, policy that we'll consider at the next meeting? and get it out in the next board packet. Sure. And if there are issues related to that that we need to discuss um, just about that kind of a rulemaking, um, Mr. Hill could cover it in the orientation. Sure. This poli policy could be generalized for all applications because I know we, we do require it for all the other applications, but I'm not so sure that it's yeah. written in stone, yeah. so maybe we could. That would be great. And it really would be helpful for all parties because I would have had an opportunity to review that case yeah. and have been better prepared and right. the Caputos wouldn't have been blindsided with a lot of information that... No one wants to be in this position. No. Well, I was certainly looking forward to something in the packet from the applicants, from the appellants myself, uh, so that I could have the time to study it. Well, I, yeah. I, I worry in a case like this that this is being set up, you know, it's time to go to court, probably be on this. Oh, yeah. You got two people who are both attorneys, and it's going to go to court. And I was really concerned that we put together a strong and as a defensible case as we can. I find no fault with what you did. I didn't want you to misinterpret my, my vote there. I'm just trying to be very, very cautious on this subject for two reasons. One, I think protection of the shoreland is a primary responsibility for us in this town particularly. I Secondly, I just, I know this is going to go to court. Right. Um, and uh, I was nodding my head in agreement with you when you were saying out that it's an important issue, and it, and it really is, um, and there's a lot of information. I think that the record uh, uh, is certainly adequate to support uh, the board's decision uh, in, in denying the appeal. Uh, there's a, there's a lot, of, lot of information that has been submitted, and some, you know, the pictures by Bruce are in the record. And, uh, information submitted by the Caputos, and I, and I really thought that the Armstrongs did a very good job in, in presenting their uh, arguments. I, I disagreed with where they were coming down on something. But See, I would have preferred to have the opportunity, and this goes back to having them submit things ahead of time, too. I would have preferred to have the opportunity to pick apart their arguments in a yep. little more decisive yep. way. Or adopt them. If that was yeah, true. either way, examine yeah. them, examine them carefully and prudently, right. and either adopt them or reject them with reason. We are still in formal session. Um, we have. Uh, this has been a good discussion, though, and I will look forward to seeing a, a draft of a policy that we can address at the next meeting. Um, we are planning to meet um, an informal session for a, an orientation for new members as well as a legal review um, by Mr. Hill for the other board members. Yes, and I just, we, we would not be able to talk about any specific cases. We wouldn't talk about this case tonight at that meeting because uh, it w that would be inappropriate. But we can talk, we can talk about general issues of variances and burdens of proof and things like that. Yeah. Do the new board members all have all the orientation material? They've, They've been got sent the ordinance and the state state laws regarding zoning. Okay. Question: uh, Does Bruce or Mike know anything about the state practice of difficulty language being reviewed and adopted by the planning board and the town council? Do I know where it's at? Yeah, it's been reviewed by the audience committee. It went back to the last council meeting with a recommendation from the audience committee to, to, to adopt the practical difficulty with no recommendation for the setback reductions, but with a recommendation that the council meet as a whole 
at a workshop on February 7th. Uh, and where it goes from there is okay. anybody's guess. Is it recommended that someone from the zoning board be there? I think traditionally the chair that, goes. Yeah. But the chair, the chair had, the former chair had been attending yeah. those meetings. It's most unfortunate that we're still in the middle of this, especially since I'm in Dallas on the 7th. I would ask. Give the assistant. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have to be there anyway because I, I'm on the Historic Preservation Committee and I think we're also meeting with the Town Council that same night, I believe. Yes. That is so just I'll so be there, perfect. I'll be there anyway. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm going to hold you to I did my best, Jack, to try to get you out. <laughs> okay, then we'll look forward to a full report on that at the right. next meeting. It would be helpful to um, have some, Bruce, it would be helpful to have some written material to the board if, if there is a, some action from that. <laughs> In advance, so that they can digest it. Yeah, I'm sorry. On, on that issue, after the work work session next week, um, if there's minutes available, until I'll put them in the board packets to get it out for people in writing. Six. Of this. Yeah. Up for next week. Yeah. I think she means the workshop. On the workshop. Oh, council on oh, yeah. Practical difficulty. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we can talk about that later. Okay. okay. Um, any other communications? Then I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, I'd just like to have one brief comment. Since I'm not going to be here next time, and there's been a request that there be maybe a draft of a rule put together addressing restrictions on presentation of documents, evidence, that that be drafted in a way that is as minimally restrictive as possible, but still trying to provide us with enough advanced information so that we can make an intelligent decision and do our homework before we come up here. And not on fairly blind side, opposing sides, but still being flexible enough to recognize that a lot of people come in here without the benefit of legal counsel. And that we can <coughs> absorb a lot of information for the first time uh, sitting up here. Um, it's and amazing we, how much. And, and we always have the option if we feel that it's inappropriate because we can give them too much to make a decision to table the matter. Weighing in, of course, if we think that there is an attempt to do that intentionally right. to create some hardship on the other side by a delay, then obviously we factor that in. <coughs> um, I would just hate to try and create federal district court type rules of right. live by this or no. die. Right. Yep. <laughs> That's reasonable. <laughs> Thanks for. No, we've had. Joe knows. <laughs> we've had bad, bad precedents here. Last minute submissions. Oh, we sure have, even in our short tenure. Yeah. 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 Is there any other communications issues? I'm still Make a motion, motion to adjourn. Second. Any second. All in favor? All Aye. opposed? Okay. Thank you, everybody, for hanging in there. <coughs> David. Thank you. Yeah. David.